pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and, to and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and good evening. Uh, is there any public comment from the board? Um, I would like to welcome Katie Adams to the board. Um, this is my first meeting since you've been with us. Welcome. Um, I reviewed the meetings that I've missed on YouTube and feel fairly caught up. A lot's been going on. I want to thank Katie for her contribution to the Flat Hill Road water issue discussion. She's absolutely right. When water crossing the road negatively impacts the integrity of the road, it's the town's responsibility to see that the effects of this water are mitigated. $500,000 was set aside in the $4 million debt exclusion for road pavement to do exactly that, engineer solutions to deal with these conditions. I appreciated hearing the DPW director state at the last meeting that Flathill Road would not be paved until this situation is resolved. Good for him. As I would hope will happen with other such issues in town. I also applaud Chairman Toll's suggestion that the Stormwater Task Force and the Conservation Commission become involved in these issues. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Sure. Um, at our last meeting, a resident um, commented on the um, conditions of the property behind the old primary school. And I just wanted to thank the DPW and Jack Rodequins. They actually went and cleaned up the playground and just brought it back to sort of its natural state as best as they could. And that being said, I feel that the um, grounds have always sort of been maintained there. Uh, the grass is always mowed and it always looks as good as it can. And the um, real eyesore is the building, but I just wanted to thank them for being so responsive to the fact that there was a complaint and it's been dealt with. And I, I think too, if you go back there, I went back there since it's been cleared and um, really study the land and see it as a piece of open space. I hope we can continue to talk about the potential of it being a town green. Thank you. Any public comment from the public? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ron Delicia, 181 Reservoir Road. Um, in the past, one of the issues I raised in emails to this board was poor communication between public bodies. After attending the Open Space Ad Hoc Committee meeting last week, I realized it was necessary to comment publicly on this subject. During the meeting, I learned a significant price tag can be attached to poor communication, over $100,000. My initial impression based on comments during the meeting was that the school and those involved in the Wallace Park improvements were not diligent in seeking alternative funding sources for the field and park projects. But after reading all the information available online for the Open Space Committee, it became apparent poor communication was a two-way street, which is usually the case. Even if someone from the school, someone involved with the Wallace Park project, or a member of the public had followed the work of the Open Space Committee dating back to 2011, it would have been impossible to conclude these projects if incorporated into an open space plan and submitted to the state would have qualified for grants. Nowhere could I find this specific information. Not once did an agenda or minutes mention or refer to such opportunities. The work of the committee focused solely on farms and conservation land. There is no specific mission statement for the committee, only a brief description on the first page of the open space plan. The first specific reference to school and park properties is in a chart which was buried on page 36 of the document. I asked myself why someone who knew these projects could have been delayed and incorporated into an open space plan did not speak up while discussions of these projects were occurring. Fortunately, there are steps which can be taken to avoid such poor communication in the future. I am aware the town is working on updating the website, which is a necessary step, and I hope will include the actual text. This board recently signed a renewal contract with Comcast, which doubled the revenue percentage provided to PAC. I do not think it is unreasonable for this board to re request an expansion of meeting coverage. 
I also suggest during appointment and reappointment processes, this board inquire about availability and willingness to work with other boards as needed. Why not make it clear there is an expectation of cooperation between boards? Provide appointees with a list of other boards they may need to interact with and follow the work of. I recognize this board has no authority over other elected bodies in town, but I want to mention a few elected officials, aside from the Board of Selectmen members, who actively seek communication with other boards. Karen Menard of Parks attends and comments to other boards on overlapping issues. I have attended obscure, unrecorded meetings where we were the only two members of the public in attendance. I can say the same of Dave Passios of the Board of Health, who regularly attends and comments at meetings which he is not required to participate in. Greg Bittner is another great example from the Planning Board. I have heard him inquire at least a handful of times about organizing a chair's meeting. I hope the actions to improve communication by some of our elected officials will inspire other elected and appointed officials to do the same. Individual boards cannot continue to operate in a bubble separate from each other and separate from the town as a whole. I have always believed this is detrimental and now I know it can be costly. Thank you. Please. Hi, Hannah Anderson, 780 West Street. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know about a fundraiser that's happening in town. It's the AED fundraiser. And it's to get six AEDs for the Lunenburg Police Department cruisers that don't have them yet. Um, the fundraiser is on Thursday, June 14th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Lunenburg Middle High School, where the Lunenburg Police Department will be playing civilians, also known as the Lifelong Learning Men's Basketball Team. It's a $5 entry and five and under are free. All proceeds go to the AEDs. So far, um, with the GoFundMe, we have raised $1,610. And today, I was able to give um, a chunk of that to the police department. It was $1,318.09 because it empties out once a month. And that's the schedule I have it on right now. But just wanted to let everyone know about it. There's raffles. There's tons of raffles, by the way. My dining room table's full. Um, <laughs> actually, my whole dining room. It's really sad <laughs> and exciting. But then there's also going to be 50-50 and a bake sale. And I just hope everyone comes down and helps out. So the, is the raffle going to be at the basketball game? Yes. So the raffle itself, with all the items, will be announced during the third quarter, right before the fourth. And the items you can go up to buy tickets will be in the cafeteria with the bake sale. But the 50-50 will be going around the gym as the game plays and that'll be announced at the same time and that's 79 7 to 9 p.m on Thank thursday you. thursday july 4th june 14th oh god that. <laughs> <laughs> thank all? you thank no. you for your efforts thank you Good evening, Adam Bernie, Land Use Director. I just want to remind the board, as I said the last time I was here, on the 25th of this month, June, it's a Monday at 6.30, the Planning Board will be having a informational slash listening slash discussion session about um, recreational marijuana or non-medical adult use marijuana, however you want to label it, and the uh, feelings of the community on where, when, how um, the different categories of use should be implemented uh, so they can take some time to develop the bylaw over the summer and, and present something prior to town meeting and get some, some feedback. Um, town council will be there to answer the more meaty legal questions, uh, but really they want to hear from the public and understand what people may or may not be willing to accept, may or may not be um, wanting and and how they, they may be going forward so 25th of June 6 30 p.m. this room how much leeway does the community have aren't there uh, are there no come on the 25th and I can tell you <laughs> <laughs> uh, th there's a fair amount of leeway um, in so much as and again we're gonna get into the weeds but uh, you can you can prohibit any and all portions we were a yes community so it's a two-tiered process we'd have to do a bylaw and uh, a local ballot vote um, but 
time, place, and manner is really what the bylaw would be looking at, where, when, and how. And then most communities I've seen that have either passed it or have pro pro proposed it have done so by special permit. Um, so again, there's the discretion involved in that. Um, you walk a fine line with some, some other legal issues, but I think a lot of that will get flushed out on the 25th. So will you have samples of things other communities have done already at this meeting? I don't think that we're going to go that far. I think we want to talk about the general issues. I mean, we can I can pull together some that have passed, but I think it's more, do people want to accept it? Do people not want to accept it? If they want to accept it, where, how, all that kind of different stuff. But, but, but you can't forbid it unless you do a bylaw and a ballot. And Correct. Because we voted yes on the mm -hmm. statewide issue. Mm -hmm. So it isn't really, do you want to accept it? You have to. Well, though, no, I mean, if, if there's a, and again, I think, you know, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but if there's a strong feeling of we don't want to allow retail marijuana, then the board could go forth with a, a ban and a, and a ballot vote. But again, that's all sort of, I think we're, you know, cart before the horse right now. Yeah, it'd be good to have some examples of what other <coughs> communities have done. All right. Thanks. Any other public comment from the public? Okay. We have no announcements other than the, the two we just had. Uh, first order of business is a reor annual reorganization of the board. Uh, we start with the chair. Do I have any nominations for chair of the board? I would like to nominate Jamie Toll, chairman for, of the board. I'd second that. Or any other nominations? Sure. I would nominate Bobby Russell. I'll second that for discussion. Any other nominations? Any discussion? Um, I appreciate the, the, the nomination. Um, I, I've not talked with other members, but I talked with Jamie. Um, it's my belief that, that there should be a regular turnover of chairs uh, within committees. Um, uh, there should be a period of time so that uh, a chair can uh, get acclimated, learn the, the operations of a committee, and then uh, uh, have a year or two to uh, uh, do work uh, and not having to worry about the operations. Um, I think Jamie's done a good job. I'm just concerned that, that uh, continuing with the same chair for, you've been three years, chair? So for the fourth year, um, it is a concern of mine uh, relating to uh, how it looks. Um, uh, we had an election where um, the one candidate won by 13 votes over the other. Um, and I'm just concerned that uh, we need to make sure that we keep doing the work to uh, improve communications. Uh, uh, and that's my concern about continuing with the uh, current operation. I feel that um, as long as the chair is doing good work, I don't think it's, there's a necessity to rotate chairs. I think Jamie's done a great job, and he's gotten a lot of things started, and I would like to see him continue. May I comment? Please. Um, for much of my year, for me, it was from... Um, just a community point of view trying to communicate with the board and that's what led me to running was to be here as somebody that I would hope would make it easier for communication I had struggles public commenting I've had public comments um, interrupted and so what led me to nominate Bob was I've served on charter review with him and he's our chair there and no matter what people's differences were or no matter what we were talking about I thought he led a really fair comfortable meeting and really made sure communication was happening I feel like sometimes even when we were on the opposite side of something we would almost chuckle about it because that he I felt like you showed me a lot of respect and this year I haven't always found that space and so I feel like I would, would like to see you as chair to continue that sort of respect that you had shown me at Charter. I'd just say that um, 
on the support of Jamie's chair and also building reuse where he was a chair and capital planning where he was a chair and always did a great job. And it's very difficult to be chair and get, stay involved in the meeting yourself too. And he's always done a great job at that. Not that I don't think you'd be good at that too, Bob, because you've done a great job filling in when he's, he's gone. But I'd, I'd uh, like to see Jamie continue. And if I may comment again, I think you've just shown that oftentimes he is the chair and I think sometimes we need to let other voices be heard. Well, I just say, having been a chair myself, it's you may actually make a sacrifice of having your voice not heard by being the chair, and it's it's a very difficult thing to do. And perhaps somebody would be willing to make that sacrifice, a different person. You know, I feel like um, Jamie has always gone out of his way to let our voices be heard. I I felt very comfortable expressing my opinion even when I knew it was different from Jamie's. <laughs> and Jamie has always um, given me the freedom to express my opinion. Just, just in response to the ability of, of, of running a meeting and letting people speak, I think that I have always endeavored to, uh, to hear voices. There are times when the flow of the meeting or the position of the uh, the actual, you know, where we are in the agenda requires that I either shorten uh, input or I uh, restrict the input to members of the board who are, who are deliberating on, on those issues. But I, I have always tried to include uh, listening to the public. Uh, I think I have stretched a little bit and, and, and invited certain members of the public to be part of the conversation even when it wasn't parts of the meeting where that was called for. But I certainly feel that I would uh, abide by the, uh, the wishes of this board and uh, feel that Bob would be an excellent chair as well. Would you be willing to serve, continue to serve as chair? I would. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we, we will vote based on the order of the nominations. Uh, all those in favor of Jamie, we say aye. 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 Those opposed? Do they do, do, they do the oppose or do I we? I guess not. I think, think we have a majority. We, we do <laughs> so I, I would make a motion that we make the vote unanimous as a way, a show of support that we're going to work together. Is there a second? Um, I'm second. comfortable dissenting. <laughs> okay. So nobody's going to have that vote, I guess. Okay. Uh, for the position of vice chair, we have a nomination. I would like to nominate Damon McQuaid. Is there a second? I'll second for discussion purposes. I would like to nominate Bob Ebersol. Second. Is there any discussion? Is there any other nominations? Is there any discussion? I would I would appreciate giving um, Damon the opportunity to serve as vice chair. First, I don't mind either way, but I think Bob, you've always done a very good job um, with motions and following things up. So either way, it shakes out. I'm I'm fine with it. I I, I concur. To, I'd I'd like to see Damon play a more active role on this board, but I think Bob has done an excellent job as vice chair and, and support him in that role as well. So in the order of the nominations, all those in favor of Damon, we say aye. Aye. Go aye for myself. All those in favor of Bob, please say aye. 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 For the position of clerk, we have nominations. I nominate Damon. Second. There are there any other nominations? We'll get you one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> there are there any other nominations? Any discussion? Thanks. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Could do something unanimous. Any opposed? I said aye. <laughs> I'm sorry, just checking. It's a long way down there, you speak up. <laughs> All righty, uh, in terms of uh, committee assignments, I think we can hold that until after we have our public hearings and we'll do that as, when we do the uh, the other assignments later on the agenda, okay? Uh, our first appointment is 705, 
and I don't know if the parties are here. It's a liquor license violation hearing for J&M Sports Bar. Is there anybody here for J&M Sports Bar? Police are uh, currently tied up in the booking room. Okay. Let's be here whenever they can break free. Okay. And the and the license holder isn't here as well, so I'm going to kind of postpone that and see see if if they break free and if the license holder shows up and then we'll determine what to do with that. Our 720 appointment, uh, 715. Uh, 715, I'm sorry, on the transfer of the liquor license is postponed until July 10th. There was an error on the address in the posting and we will, we will do that uh, discussion on July 10th and we can have the 720 appointment on the update on the bootleg or alcohol license status if the license holder is here. Yes, sir. Please come forward. Clerk. I asked no man. Good. Sir. Name and address, please. Sean Morrison, 227 Lunenburg Street, Fitchburg. Could you give us an up? Well, tell us who you are and give us an update on. So I'm one of the owners of the bootlegger. <clears throat> We're looking for an extension. We are working on um, negotiating now on uh, reopening and uh, maybe a transfer, a sale. Mm -hmm. So somebody's gonna come in and maybe take over. So we're not sure exactly how it's gonna work, whether we stay on with them or uh, a complete sale. How much, how much time do you need? I would say within three months, we should have the deal put together. I would make a motion that we extend the uh, current extension that's in place by another 90 days. Uh, that allowing the bootlegger alcohol license to stay in the current ownership? Second. Do you have a date certain on that one? I don't know when the current. Okay. 90, 90 days, days from 90 days from whenever the current one it, expired. It's already expired. Already expired. Yeah. So I would so do the 90, 90 days from, from that date. Oh, from that date. Yeah. So it's a little bit shorter than 90 days. Mm -hmm. That works. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, good luck. Thank you guys, bye-bye. Have a great night. All right. We are going to have a joint meeting with the Finance Committee, and I'd ask the Chair of the Finance Committee to call the Finance Committee to order. Do you know the post up for 730. Yeah, I could do that while they're getting well, set up. organizing? <laughs> Uh, so while you guys are calling yourself to order, I'll, I'll take the interviews and appointments. We have a reserve police officer, Chief Marino. Good evening. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Don't forget, when you're in the throne, there's always a line of people that are waiting to throw you out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to recommend uh, Sam W. Christensen uh, a candidate for appointment to the position of reserve police officer. Sam uh, completed the Mass Law Enforcement Training Alliance Reserve Intermittent Academy in accordance with uh, MGL 4196B and the Municipal Police Training Committee standards. Uh, Past required employee physical and physical agility tests and an extensive background investigation. Again, I know this, I'm going to say this a hundred times because this is a habit I have. Mm -hmm. but this is a resident of Lunenburg, graduate of Lunenburg High School. Um, it's, he holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice studies, which he earned at Keene State College. Sam came to us a couple of years ago and wanted to be a, he wanted to do his internship with us, but unfortunately the college wouldn't insure him, so we weren't able to offer him the internship. So uh, I don't have that to offer you, but I know him, I know his family. Um, I spent a week at Nature's classroom with his father. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know his uncle is a lawyer, who I hold in high regard, uh, Matt Christensen. Uh, but anyways, 
Uh, if he's appointed, again, uh, as I said before, with every other uh, appointee, he'll undergo a rigorous field training program, and that will allow us extension, extensive evaluation. In that process, uh, when he proceeds to the reserve field training uh, program, it'll provide our personnel with an accurate assessment uh, of his competence, competency and work ethic and uh, interpersonal skills, integrity and honesty and so forth. So, Again, you know, we're looking at Sam as uh, very well qualified with, res with respect to his, his um, educational background, his training so far. Uh, and, and again, he's a real likable kid. And, and uh, a, Luna, you know, a Lunenburg resident. I think that's important. Uh, um, he, he obviously has a, an interest in the town. Um, and. Uh, from a police standpoint, I think that's extremely, extremely important. So I'm asking for your consideration with respect to his appointment. Who's the new selectman, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Select person. Select man's fine. <laughs> I would make a motion that we ratify the town manager's appointment of Samuel Christensen as reserve police officer. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank yeah. you, Chief. Congratulations, Sam. Call him up. Congratulations. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for serving. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, I was going to use this opportunity to have our candidate for Massachusetts Joint Transportation Committee tell us what she was planning on doing, but she is unable to be with us this evening. Maybe we can just do that when we do all our committee appointments. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Sure. Uh, so, you're all set, Ch Madam Chair. Great. Do you want to set this up for us, or do you want me to just say what we're doing? Sure, I can. Um, so we asked for a joint meeting with the finance committee and the selectmen to discuss a long-range staffing plan for the fire department and the police department, as well as an action item one of the selectmen had requested be discussed about taxing to the levy limit. So both um, Police Chief Marino and Fire Chief Sullivan are here tonight to make their presentations, and we'll proceed with the discussion after that about taxing to the levy. Okay. So I, um, actually, the Public Safety Coordinator is gonna begin with the presentation for the police department. I think the oh, oh. I switched order. Okay. Sorry. No. All right. So we're going to start with the fire department. Fire department. Okay. I'm going to ask you to use a mic, Pat, please. Uh, I'll get it closer. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Usually I'm pretty loud anyway. Again, well, uh, what I'll just. Uh, present tonight uh, was part of our staffing plan was to look to move the service to the paramedic level of ambulance care and again the point to the reason to be would be again provide a better level of care of emergency medical care to us residents and also we can potentially generate some additional revenue to offset some of the costs of the additional staffing for the department just to understand a little bit what we talk about when we talk about levels of EMS -S care, there are four levels. First responder, which is police officers, firefighters. Uh, generally, basic first aid training, they don't operate on ambulances for the most part. Basic EMT, which is about 100 to 140 hours of training. It's the minimum level to staff an ambulance. Advanced EMT, which takes about four to 500 hours of training. That's the level we're licensed at currently. Uh, Advanced EMTs can do some advanced life support. Uh, they can do intravenous, intraosseous uh, fluids, some advanced airway treatment, and some medications, as opposed to a full paramedic, which is over 2,000 hours worth of training. Uh, the big difference there, they can do a lot more cardiac work, uh, cardiac pacing, cardiac medications, pain management, and they also have a lot of uh, other medications they can deal with seizures, other medical conditions. It's a big jump from advanced to paramedic. Just a brief history of EMS in town. Uh, the fire department has operated the ambulance service 
for 49 years. Uh, we've, uh, we went to the EMT level along with all the other ambulance services in the state in the early 70s. Uh, in 1999, we upgraded to the intermediate level, which then in 2017 became the advanced level. Currently, we're licensed at the advanced level. We operate at that level at about 44% of the time due to the number of people. We have one full-time and four call advanced EMTs or paramedics. I have two more, one full-time, one call that are training at this time waiting to test. Our paramedic level care comes from outside agencies, generally uh, private ambulance in Lemonster, MedStar, and town, the Towns and Fire Department, which is a paramedic level unit too. We rely on them. If we have a patient that requires paramedic level care, they come in, their paramedic jumps in our truck, administers the care, uh, they go to the hospital with us, we pay them a fee for their service. The challenge there is, is the fluctuation in service. When we use Townsend, we're pulling their primary municipal providers away and that leaving their town to rely on their call people and their people that come back in. MedStar is a private ambulance service. Their main job is uh, inter-facility transfers. That's where they make their money. Emergency medical services or 911 work is sort of a side thing when one of their trucks is available. Uh, we also secondarily can rely on Fitchburg which is MedStar Ambulance also, and uh, Town of Ayers, advanced level service. Most of the communities around here are paramedic level, with the exception of uh, Lancaster, Shirley, and Ashby, and us. The other towns around, for the most part, are all paramedic level. Uh, with the staffing, we've talked about, case, we've been making the case for several years for 24-7 coverage. Uh, through the generosity of town meeting, we've been able to get two additional staff for FY19. That does give us 24-7 coverage. However, we need 88 hours of per diem a week to make that happen. In the staffing plan that uh, I've provided to the town manager, we've asked for three additional staffing over the next few years. That provides 24-7 coverage with career staff, and it would allow us to take the call in the per diem and be in a, you know, support that role. But we wouldn't have to worry about trying to cover some of those shifts with per diem and that. Uh, again, this would provide us two people in the station 24-7 with a third during the daytime weekdays. It's enough to staff the ambulance or the first fire truck, an understaffed fire truck going out the door. After that, we're still relying on all our call people to come in, support the rest of the operation. So why paramedic? Again, like I said, it provides a better level of service to our community. Uh, the people would be coming out of our station. We wouldn't be dependent on other communities for that service. And we can generate some additional revenue, which would offset some of the costs of the personnel. Again, just quickly, call, our call volume. Our call volume has been going up it's with the development in town. I do not see that changing. Uh, we have another large housing development or uh, apartment complex going online. There's discussion about another 70 plus units down at uh, Tritown. I don't see this decreasing. There is going to be more need for EMS in the community. And that is, you see with the advances in medicine, people are living longer, but you also see much sicker people at home. And that, that unfortunately they, they call for. Uh, I was asked about what our stats were for last year. Last year we did 10, uh, 1,022 EMS calls, which some, not all of those are transport. Some of those include lift assist, somebody needs help getting up, we go out and do that, lifeline alarms, things like that. We had 708 EMS transports. 46% of those were at the advanced life support level. And of that total number of the advanced life support, about 13%, we did ourselves at the advanced level. And 54% were at the basic life support level. However, we've also estimated there were about 53 calls that probably should have had a paramedic, but for one reason or another, either they weren't available, they were tied up somewhere else. We couldn't intercept with that truck. We didn't have them available when we brought them in at the BLS level. Adding that 53% kicks the toe. If we could f cover those calls, and that and we would have had probably about a 53, 54% ALS transport rate. So uh, startup costs, again, I, I, some of this I brought out during the budget presentation back in March. Uh, basic. Capital costs, the primary thing is the cardiac monitor uh, pacer defibrillator, approximately $37,000. 
plus about 1500 for a battery charger. Some miscellaneous equipment that's around $336 and approximately $1,573 for medications above and beyond what we carry right now. So basically just shy of $41,000 per ambulance to set them up at the, the advanced life support level. Again, the medications is probably going to be an ongoing cost that I'll talk about that. Most of the equipment has probably a 10 to 15 year lifespan on it, talking to other services that run paramedic level. A similar size call volumes to us. Uh, ongoing expenses in the budget, uh, medical control fee. We have to work under a doctor's license, even more so at paramedic level care. I had hoped our one of our medical control doctors would be here tonight, but he must not have been able to make it. Uh, that's through uh, UMass uh, Lemonster and Wachusett Emergency Physicians. We would anticipate that would cost would go up about $7,000 a year. Currently we pay about $5,000, so it would go up to about twelve. dollars Their formula is roughly a uh, dollar per person uh, population of the community. Uh, we would anticipate about an additional $3,500 a year in equipment maintenance. Most of that is a maintenance plan for the monitor defibrillator. Those have to be inspected regularly, maintained. Again, it's a medical device. You want to make sure it works when you go to use it. Uh, we anticipate about an extra $5,000 a year in supplies and uh, replacement supplies. A lot of that stuff is not replaced by the hospital. We have to take care of it ourselves. Those numbers were based on talking to uh, Princeton, uh, not Princeton, Westminster and Sterling, which run uh, paramedic level services, and they're approximately the same size we are. Re anticipated revenue increases. Uh, we anticipated, again, this is a low number. We del deliberately kept it low. And this is probably from a year or two ago. We anticipated uh, an additional $131,084 in additional revenue. How that's based is a, and we haven't changed, these are still the current ambulance rates. We have not changed those. Uh, I'll talk about that again in a little bit too. Uh, but again, about $117 a run more at the ALS level and the BLS level. The increased ALS runs were those calls we talked about that probably should have been a paramedic level call, but for whatever reason, we couldn't get one. We didn't have them available. Cardiac monitoring, because we're not a paramedic level service, we cannot bill for the use of a cardiac monitor. Operating at the paramedic level, uh, we can charge for that. That number is based off the private insurance that I'll talk about again in a little bit too. Uh, that's not the total number of transports. That's a, those are the insurances that we can actually bill. Mutual aid ALS, we would anticipate some additional calls for service out of town. The fact that most of the communities around us are paramedic level, I would not anticipate a lot of calls for us to go do ALS for someone else like towns have been doing for us. What I would see more is we're being called, say, Fitchburg needs an, a paramedic level ambulance. They don't call us because we're not that level. If we're paramedic, they might call us now instead of calling for Westminster. So we would expect maybe another 50 calls a year going to other communities to assist them, like they've been assisting us. And then there's also the savings in the budget of about 57,534. That's 90% of the number that we pay out now for these third services to come in and provide paramedic level care. And that we, is, we anticipated about 90% of that. So we figured that number in that we would save that money. Again, the revenue increases, those are based on our current ambulance rates, those numbers. The rates probably can and should be adjusted. We can go up on them. We haven't gone up on them in a few years. Uh, the thing to remember is there's a limited increase on that. Approximately 65% of our patients that we transport are Medicare, Medicaid, gov you know, mass health, government type insurance. We have to basically uh, take what they pay us. We can charge as much as we want, but they are only gonna pay a certain amount. And by law, we can't go after somebody else. Again, this is something a lot of the people that we transport are, are more elder citizens. But on the other hand, they're not gonna get whacked with a huge bill either. That's something to keep in mind that, yeah, we do charge for the service, but a lot of the, you know, the older people, the Medicare, Medicaid, are not gonna be paying that full rate. Uh, 
We also, you know, the, the numbers didn't anticipate additional call volume. Those were based on FY16, 17 call volume numbers. We've been anticipating, based on you know past year's trends, about an average of 31 calls a year increase in EMS. So that number is not calculated in. And I would again, I would expect with the development in town that to go up. Again, just quickly, some of the charts for the budget presentations, just showing the ages. The one on the left just shows ages of the people we transport. Again, biggest customers are over 55. It's concerning because I'm getting close to there myself. <laughs> uh, and again, the, as the data from Mr. Martin has shown, our over 55 population is increasing substantially in town. The younger is not so much. Again, some savings in the budget. We had talked about some of this at, at town meeting and some of the other discussions. We currently pay stipends to our on-call EMTs. Uh, once we go to 24-7 coverage, we would not need that anymore. That money actually is already planned in the budget to offset the cost of the second person uh, that we'd be hiring in FY19. Uh, the duty officer stipend, having one of the fire officers on call on the weekend, uh, eventually that would go away. That money could be reallocated within the budget. Uh, currently only about half of it is. Because of the new schedule, we'll still have per diem on Sundays. So I'll need one of the officers to be available. The other shifts with the current makeup of personnel, I'll have a fire officer on duty pretty much all the time. So again, the potential offset for the staffing and costs, when you take into consideration what we can save in the budget, and what we anticipate in revenue, <laughs> take away the anticipated expenses yearly, we estimated approximately 151,000 a year that could be go towards offset, offset salaries. I say I don't ever see this service being an enterprise fund that will fund itself. It's just going to offset better care to our residents. And again, these numbers aren't going to be fully in effect until we have 24-7 paramedic coverage. Even hiring these two people now as paramedics, we'd still need a couple more after that to be able to provide it 24-7. With licensing with the state, uh, they're going to want to see the people and they're going to want to see a plan to get to that 24-7 coverage. So again, which comes you know, first, staffing or equipment? If we currently hired two paramedics, they can work at the advanced level. So we can still utilize them. They can utilize some of their skills, not all of them, but they wouldn't be completely in, you know, unable to work. They can operate at the advanced level, so they could do some stuff. If we bought the equipment first, we can't use it until we have the people and we have the license. So the equipment would just be sitting there, clocks running on warranties, things like that. Uh, it's really better to get the, start getting the people in place than get the equipment. Hence why in the capital plan we call FY20 and 21 to fit out the ambulances. Uh, we need to be able to recruit, retrain, and retain paramedics. I've been fortunate, I've already had a couple paramedics that are interested in the positions. Uh, right now firefighter paramedics are in short supply in the state and it's a very competitive field. You know, we need we, you know, one of the, where I was going with that is would hope to have the option at some point to be able to train some of our own people. Obviously more cost effective to be able to hire them initially. Basically, if we hire them initially in our salary scale, a firefighter EMT versus a firefighter paramedic, excuse me, it's about a $5,200 difference. Versus if I have to send a guy to paramedic school, that's going to be about twelve to $15,000 plus the time off from work when he's on shift to be able to go. And that's going to take a year plus for him to get that, you know, maybe a little under a year with some of the accelerated programs. Uh, again, it would be nice, you know, I've had discussions with Ms. Lemieux about having some kind, sort of mechanism to be able to fund EMS training <laughs> for people like that. Uh, but again, obviously the, nice, the best way to do would be able to hire, you know, hire the people in as paramedics. Again, training our own people might push the timetables out a little bit further if we hired them out of the gate as paramedics. I could see probably in FY20, if we continued down that road, we could be operational at the paramedic level. And again, with two people, we wouldn't be able to do it 24-7. State regulations say once we start running 
or we get the license, within three years we have to be able to say we can provide it 24-7. So that's where, again, we need to be looking for those additional people as time goes on. And the state would support that as long as they see that there's a plan to get to that 24-hour coverage. Uh, and like I say, the revenue that would come in, the full impact of that is going to vary. Uh, I would estimate anywhere between from one to three years from the time the we have the license. Uh, depending on the experience and training level of the paramedics and how many we have and how often we're at that level, we're, there's going to be a time frame where we're probably still utilizing some of the outside services. So it's not going to be a, an instantaneous, we're operating at that level, we're seeing that revenue. It's going to be a curve coming up to that. So again, the summary, uh, the additional three staff, one per year, from FY you know, 20, 20 through 22, would give us 24-7 coverage of two career people, 24-7 with a third in the daytime. Again, backed up and supplemented by the call force and our per diem personnel. The paramedic level service is an answer to an increasing demand for more advanced medical care out in in the, you know, in the street, in the public. It's a better level of care for our citizens. It gives us a little bit more accountability. Right now, and it doesn't happen often, but if we have a problem with another services paramedic, we have to go to them and hope they address it. If we have people in house, they're working with our medical director. If there's an issue, we can correct it a lot faster and address a problem a lot faster. And, and again, there can be some revenue to offset some of the potential costs that would come along with this. <laughs> That's it. It was close to 15 minutes. <laughs> that was very <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. Sure. Yeah, just have oh, sure. Mm. So at this point, what is your, how far out are you seeing applying for a paramedic license? If, if these two people that we're looking at in FY19, if I could hire them as paramedics, FY20, get the equipment off the, ca you know, out of, the capital plan, and probably sometime, well, let's see, FY20 would be summer of 19, apply for the license, with the thought of two of hiring probably a third paramedic, July 1, and that sometime probably by the, by the December of 19, I would hope we could be online. Okay. Um, the other question I had was that when you were talking about the levels of training, the paramedic level was 2,000 plus hours, and the level below that was um, about 500 hours. Is it 2,000 plus hours beyond the 500, or is it no, 1, 2,000 from the ground up? It's about okay. you know two and a half times the advanced level. Um, and then, um, if you hire two people as paramedics, they're on a different salary schedule than everybody else. There's a different pay scale. Okay. For in our in the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, so currently, do we have people who are paramedics no. in that schedule? No. Okay, no. And then um, the other question I have is actually for the board of selectmen. Because and before I um, open up other money questions, because basically I know that there's been a big push to get to the 24/7 coverage, and um, and we're almost there. Um, but I'm not sure that there's been a discussion or a decision made that we're going paramedic. And if we are going paramedic, when? Um, and then I think that's probably, for me as a finance committee member, um, when I would probably really get into the weeds here with, with the numbers. But, um, but yeah, I think one of the things that I was waiting for after town meeting was I, I wasn't sure that the Board of Selectmen had made a determination that that was the direction we were going to go. So I think there was piece of me that was just waiting for that. But um, but thank you. It's a great presentation. I got a lot. Most of my questions were answered before you finished. Does there anybody else have questions on the specifics here? Mark, come on. You always do. Yeah. My only question is how are we going to pay for this? Um, we need to. I, th I think there's some increase in revenue from the paramedic level services, uh, but not nearly enough uh, to fund five additional positions. And we haven't yet heard from the police chief. I have the same question. If we're going to hire uh, one police officer every year for 10 years, that's a significant commitment on the expense side. Where's the revenue uh, to pay for these uh, positions? Um, so that's, that's a concern I have. I don't expect that we'll have an answer to that tonight. 
Um, but before we can commit uh, to these staffing levels, we need to make sure that we can sustain uh, the revenue required to uh, to pay for it. Yeah. I, get, I guess I get, the one thing I could say is, I, I, even if we don't go paramedic level, I still need those people. This is a way to uh, hopefully offset Understood. some, some yeah. of that. Yep. And again, there are some options to increase some of the revenue through the ambulance building, but like I said, in good conscience, I cannot say we're not, it'll pay for itself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the demographics aren't there for it. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I've got a, oh. a, a technical question. When you, do you need to have two paramedics on at any one time? Uh, you can operate uh, under a waiver with one paramedic and one basic, and that would be the model we'd be looking okay. for. There are situations where the state requires you to have two paramedics if possible, and what we would envision as we got up and operating, you'd probably look at recalling an off-duty paramedic. So that was the question, is that if you had a paramedic that was out sick or on vacation, you how would, do you cover that? You would fill it with another one of the paramedics. Okay. John? Chief, I have a question regarding the, uh, and I'm, I, I hope I'm not getting on the financial weeds, but uh, I have a question with respect to the revenue uh, generation. Mm -hmm. During your slide, it, it occurred to me that the ambulances would likely be used more. Does that mean that uh, the replacement frequency of the ambulance would uh, go up a little bit? I would still anticipate they'd be around the 10-year cycle, that we run them five years primary and then five years as the backup. Okay. Truck. I, I, I guess my answer to that was I think the calls are going to go up whether we're running at the paramedic level or not. You might see a small increase, like I said, with the mutual aid, mm -hmm. but otherwise we're still going to be doing the transports. Thanks. So. Yes, but the roads are so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, unless you go down Summer Street. <laughs> They're going to fix that. <laughs> sure. So I have a question. If, if the town invests in all this training mm -hmm. and every how your resources come up to the service levels you want. Is there any retention kind of incentives for them to stay and not like, jump? It's, it's, that's always a challenge. You know, there are a lot of services that pay better than us. That's a discussion to be had down the road in the pay scales to keep it up, right? You know, one of the things that I'm looking at, luckily I have a couple of people that are interested. That are for, one's a current member of the department, one's a former member, if I had the opportunity to grab them. Uh, both live nearby and that and would be around but that is that is a challenge as far as bringing the people on board they would be there would be an agreement that if they're a paramedic they'd have to remain a paramedic as a condition of their employment okay. but it's always a challenge for people jumping to somewhere else fortunately in the fire service people don't move around quite as much but so how do, how do like um, the salaries in Lunenburg compared to the, the local somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. we you know there wasn't an adjustment made on the last contract and that that brought the positions up a little bit and that so we're probably about in the middle somewhere okay and health care uh, health care you know it's, it's good yeah. most of the communities are about the same nowadays mm -hmm. it's usually with firefighters it's a function of the, what the schedule is uh, you know, some of that, you know, that kind of stuff, and what the pay is. And then recertification? Recertification, they have to do 48 hours every two years uh, of continuing education, as opposed to a basic EMT is 40 hours. Uh, most of that we do in-house, and that, so we can usually handle that there. And it's $150 to recert, which we figured that in. That's figured in in some of the expenses. Just, just as a matter of comparison, assuming somebody has the same number of years experience, what's the difference in salary for a paramedic versus a firefighter? Uh, about $5,200 okay. right it's now. It's not a huge number. No, okay. no. Like I said, it's, to, to bring these two people in as paramedics versus basics, it's about $10,200 roughly. And then how many firefighters total do you anticipate at this time that would be full-time firefighters? Full-time, if the plan was followed out, would be nine total. Okay. Currently with the two, we'll have six. So. I'm sorry, I missed that question. Was that the additional, that's an addition? Nine total, when, when okay. if we followed the plan that I gave to the town manager out, it would be nine total at the end of that, counting the existing staff. I, I think to answer uh, the chair's question, 
you know, I don't think the selectmen have addressed this as an issue to date, but it's always been on the horizon as a budget issue. As we, as we look at town growth, revenue growth, capital planning, you know, the, the, the switch between uh, basic and, and uh, uh, paramedic has been on the chief's long-term plan for a long time. The growth into the equipment that's required for that, the growth of both of our public safety services to accommodate the, the growth in town has always been on our radar. And I think it kind of what we're trying to accomplish tonight is to, is to get it a little more front and center so that as we go into our longer range planning and our budget discussions, it's, it's something we can think of mm -hmm. even relative to the other question that we wanted to talk about tonight mm -hmm. is the two and a half percent discussion. And this was discussed during union negotiations as well when we right. talked about what the positions were. Right. That I believe paramedic is in the contract. It is. But it is. by making it in the contract, it didn't say that we supported or didn't support it, but we wanted to prepare for it if it was supported. So it's been discussed, and I think it, I personally support the concept. How we're going to pay for it is the question. I also support it, too. I think now is when we're hiring new people, increasing the staff, if you're going to hire them, they should be paramedics, in my mind. And ten thousand dollars compared to the other things we spend, more than ten thousand dollars on is. The, the challenge money. would be if if we hire these people as basics, and then down the road, we change. We okay. Well, we didn't want to do it now. Now we want to do it down the road. Now what do you mm. what do you do with them? <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. At some point, we got to. If we really want to go this direction, we got to pull the trigger, and at least start down the road. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, just one other comment. Um, I I support the concept, um, but I'm I'm still concerned about our ability to afford it. Uh, in one element that we haven't really touched on, uh, but it has come up in other discussions of staffing, and that's the pension and OPEB uh, liability that that goes along with any ads to staff. Uh, so when we look at the total impact of to the town, we need to understand. Uh, pension and OPEB as well. Can you give me a second to dig that number out? <laughs> well, that's going to be a moving target. Well, it's exactly. These numbers are a couple of years old, but we, it was approximately 24 to 25,000 per person on that. <laughs> on that. Per year. That was per year. And if I'm not mistaken, public safety people, it, it's not just a number per headcount. Public safety people are slightly more expensive than just other headcount yep. when you look at yep. pension and OPEP. That's right. So, you know, that's part of the equation. And, and I imagine there are provisions in the contract uh, about uh, accumulated sick time, uh, age uh, requirements that... that other than th three existing members right now, there's no... They have accumulated sick time, but there's no buyback for okay. any new hires. that's good. There's so only three people hires. left in the organization that have that. And isn't there a younger age uh, bracket? You can for, uh, for newer retire. hires can retire at maximum 57 now. Used to be 50, well, some of us it's 55, but they changed that a few years and ago. And what's the, the minimum? The, mini the minimum, the, is, is the, mi the well. minimum, yeah, you don't get much. I mean, it's, it's 20 years, but they usually look with an age to, to max out okay. in that. You've got to be up around 57. Okay. And that's starting young. Thank you. But it's also, you know, in our, in our jobs, people don't live quite as long, unfortunately. <laughs> and that's the, and it's a young man's job. I'm finding that out more and more every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other part of the discussion was um, that we have talked over time about looking particularly at public safety when we look at the growth numbers. Um, but I'm not sure that was, that was the previous town manager's um, recommendation as I recall and I guess the question would go to the current town manager if that's also the current town manager's sense that would be my position that we'd look to new growth and that has come up in our conversations during the budget as far as additional staff for public safety because of the growing population and our rise in new growth figures that we that's where we would look to to earmark funds for added staff Terry, can I make a comment? This, actually, this is, I'm not sure who's sure. reading this is, but absolutely. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, would you like the mic? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Uh, Use the mic, though, Jim, please. Just a comment or question 
uh, with respect to your comment, Mark. Well, what's the town's position on establishing an old PEB liability trust fund or, or HAB day uh, with the Municipal Organization Act? Old yes. PEB? Yes. State Specialist Purpose Stabilization Fund as well? Yes. Right. Yes. 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 And we've started to fund it, but it's low. It, it's it's a very it's low. It's there. Yes. Yeah. It's there. Yes. It, it's a very low funding contribution against a very large liability. But it's a start. Right? But it it's is a, a start. It's absolutely yes. a start. And it's a commitment. It's a start. It's a commitment, and it's a moving target. It's it's one of those that it will go up and down based on mm -hmm. demographics, based on. Um, what the health plans do over time and what investments do over time. I mean, because I know today I was also reading uh, one of the other areas of the budget was the um, addressing the OPEB liability, not the OPEB liability, but the retirement liability of the Worcester County retirement system um, and the fact that we're contributing so much to that. And that was a big hit several years ago that we didn't anticipate. All of a sudden they were catching up. Um, so that's one of the other issues that we've had with trying to address the staffing situation as it's come over time just because, you know, like every year when we think we're, we're almost there, something comes up that we didn't anticipate, like, okay, all of a sudden you're required to fund this. So. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think we're there. The reality is, too, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, with social change with respect to the baby boomer era, uh, is going to create a little bit of a spike over the next couple of years. Am I wrong or right with respect to the, the fund? The old, old uh, I, It depends, really. It, one of the things that they look at is as people retire and new people come in, then all of a sudden that changes the, you know, like all of us, if you hire somebody at the age of 20, um, and, and you anticipate that they're going to be contributing for a particular amount of time, that's going to affect the OPEB liability as well. Um, because, and, and that's, it's still something that we have to get more of a handle on in terms of making sure it's funded, but I'm not even sure to what point to fund it, but I think the other thing that the town manager has done is said, okay, any percentage of, is it free cash? Yeah. Is going, automatically going cash. into OPEB. Right, but what, I, I think the point, I probably missed the point is, you're going to have more people retiring, more new people coming on contributing more. Am I correct? Won't that affect it? They, they don't contribute more towards the OPEB. <coughs> no, it's no. more towards the pension. The pension. They do. Right. They're actually contributing towards their own OPEB over time. So um, that's the, one of the problems was that 20 years ago, people were paying as you go. And, um, and then if people are staying in the retirement system for 30 years, after they've retired, nobody's been funding that. So, so that's been coming out of current um, expenses. So now the state's saying, no, we can't, well, you know, now we're here, and there's all of us people who are, you know, getting closer to retirement age who are going to really, you know, hit the system hard. Um, so, it, but the, as of right now, the town is still able to handle what Worcester's asking for and what we have to pay currently, so. But the, but the whole the whole fact is that you anticipate that you pay post employment benefits out of operating costs, and the reason you have an OPEB fund is to, is to to handle bubbles that go through the system as a result of baby booms and things like that. I mean that that's technically the OPEB it, the the OPEB shortfall is a mathematical thing that's that's worked out based on not being able to handle actual post-employment benefits out of operating expense. And actually, I'm also um, conflating two different things. Right. I'm, I've, I have retirement, the pension in my head with the health insurance payments in my head, and they actually are just both liabilities that we're just currently coming to terms with. But, and, but so. we have a, a requirement to fully fund the pension liability. Exactly. By 34, I think. 2034. Mm -hmm. Right. Which, mm -hmm. which is the same year that the social, social security system uh, goes bankrupt, <laughs> um, <laughs> coincidentally. Uh, but we don't yet have a requirement to fully fund the OPEP. Right. Uh, and, and to Jamie's point, uh, the operating expense can cover those bubbles for now, but we have to build up mm -hmm. a fund mm -hmm. to offset that liability. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we may be required uh, to to offset the full liability. And in another way that um, we could address it is through contract negotiations. You can lower your OPEB liability 
with new hires. That's right. Yep. Change yep. the contract for, right. for new hires. And I'll echo what, what Damon said as far as um, we're not required to tonight decide whether we should have paramedic or not. And, but you have funding that town meeting appropriated to hire people as of July 1st. Um, hiring paramedics is going to increase the cost. Um, assuming you could pay for it, you're not required to actually have a paramedic program, but you have more qualified people as a mm -hmm. result of that. If, so. we could, if we hired paramedics, we could put them to work day one at the advanced level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that makes the most sense yeah, and once we look at, you know obviously you have to look at the budget and all sorts of other things but i think in general we're in favor of that mm, yes that. absolutely i guess we should hear the other the police side of the equation <laughs> thank you chief is that all right <laughs> <laughs> me too but the point is I don't want to stand here because I'm just blocking. I mean, you, yeah. can, you can sit and use the mic. I don't want to sit. I'm not going to. Amanda's probably going to be better at introducing this, this, uh, this plan that we have. And it, it just speaks to what I was just talking about. I mean, I, I think the federal government, the state, and then the state finally wants everybody to get a, get a handle uh, on uh, these liabilities, make you more aware of them. And, plan for the future and essentially that's what we're trying to do and what I can understand is um, we're planning we're planning to buy capital as a matter of fact the plan was to dump money you know the stabilization uh, free cash stabilization fund special purpose right special special purpose to fund large ticket items in the future which I think is a phenomenal idea. So down the road, we're not borrowing money to buy fire trucks that cost a, a million dollars or whatever. It's a great idea. And I heard somebody comment at town meeting that, well, it costs more money to borrow money than it does to save money. Well, that's true, but eventually, the thought process was, correct me if I'm wrong, that's gonna force that, that uh, that amount of money that we have to borrow to buy fire trucks and so forth down our debt service down mm -hmm. so eventually we're going to catch up hopefully and make we're going to we're not going to spend as much money isn't that the idea Absolutely. so idea. my question is why don't i do that with my operating budget I, i've come here uh, for seven years asking for help we're never going to catch up let's face it we, we, as Mark said, where are we going to get the money? Well, I'm going to present you with a plan. You guys can figure out where the money's going to come from. <laughs> I'm going to tell you we need it. And I, you know, I'm, I apologize. My, my adrenaline is that uh, right now is really, my heart's still racing. I went to a call before I came in, had a high risk call. Um, so if my attitude seems a little off, that's probably why. Because it just, it, it's, it's, speaks to what I'm going to talk about right now. We have to be prepared. I, I uh, you know, we, we cannot operate at this level anymore. I, I came on this department in 1979. In 1984, I was working alone on the midnight day shift because that's all there was, it was one person. And somebody got the idea to hire another person because they thought, well, maybe it's kind of dangerous <laughs> for one person to be working those hours. Well, gee, there's a, there's a thought. <laughs> so we went up to two people on that shift. So we had two people per shift. Now, finally, in 1984. And here it is, 2018. And uh, I got to go to a high-risk call with a female cop Guy with a knife, we had to disarm him uh, because that's the only person I had a bill. I, my vest is in the trunk because I don't wear a vest, I'm an administrative person, so I keep it in the trunk. I did not have time to put it on. So, uh, anyways, 
I'll have Amanda go over the numbers. Uh, I think there was a mistake. John and I and Amanda went over it. Yeah. I think you added up all the years and came up with five million dollars. That's not the case. Yeah, I'm asking for seventy-eight hundred or seventy-eight thousand dollars this year. If you multiply it times ten, that's seven hundred eighty thousand dollars. Add all the uh, increases in that we anticipate, and it's just guesswork. It's about a, it's realistically about a million dollars over ten years. I've got 40 lockers in the station. I don't need to buy lockers. Um, eventually, if we increase our full-time numbers, we'll be able to decrease our part-time numbers so that the building means nothing right now. I mean, eventually, we're going to have to develop the upstairs uh, into office space, but uh, outside of an elevator, as long as it's not public, uh, we can develop the office space up there if we, if we need to move somebody upstairs. Um, police cars. Uh, one car takes care of three people theoretically because they only they need a car shift. So if you got three pe people, three people in each car, I'll need three cars, two more cars over the next ten years after FY20. FY20, I'm slated to get two more cars at Aladdin next one for the people we just hired, and then three more after that in the ten years period. will take care of our, our vehicle needs, I believe. I don't think that's a huge amount of money. Um, I budget to what, 1.6 um, now or something like that. Um, I didn't do any comparisons, I'll be quite honest with you. I know I know towns of similar demographics, similar size, uh, police departments and so on and so forth uh, have budgets much higher than mine. Mine's not, not that high in comparison. Um, I can give you all the stats you want. I got the sticker in my pocket that I gave you. I know I don't. Jeez, <laughs> but I ran out of the station. <laughs> Uh, I could do, rerun the program. I did. No, I don't want to do that to the finance committee again. I, same, just it's, it's, I think it's mm -hmm. I'm just you know repeating and repeating and repeating myself. So it's a million dollars over ten years. I don't know where the money's going to come from. I and mean, we talked about growth money. Town's going to grow. It's going to continue to grow. Right now, it's you know we don't just deal with what's inside the borders of the community. And this goes for the fire department too. Talking on behalf of the fire department, there's no way in this day and age we shouldn't be running one up without a full-time fire department as well. I left Fitchburg, uh, West Fitchburg last week after I picked up a police car. I had detail. I, I go way up to West Fitchburg because the guy only charges a 75 bucks a car to completely detail a car, which is a $300, $400 job. Charges the police department 75 bucks for our cruises. It took me 45 minutes to get back from Fitchburg. Why? Because if you get out there and drive around, a, the traffic's heavy. It's heavy everywhere. I can't get out of the police station sometimes uh, without a long wait. Uh, outside of putting my blue lights on, sometimes <laughs> it's, it's literally three or four minutes trying to get out of the driveway. You all know that. Uh, everywhere you go, you, you get on 495 in the morning, north from Route 2, it's a parking lot. You go south, it's a parking lot. You know, 128 for Moon 2, it's a parking lot. It's that way everywhere, and it's not going to slow down. It's going to increase, and it's going to affect us here. And it is affecting us, and it's going to continue to affect us. We need to be prepared. That's our job. So this is how I'm proposing to do it. I think it's smart. We want to plan. We should be planning. I mean, I, I know I, I need a roof in 20 years. I got to put money away because in 20 years I'm going to be wet if I don't replace my roof. So I put money away for it. That's what we should be doing. Planning. We should be thinking about things like OPEB. That's what the state's trying to get us to do. So we can plan on how we're going to pay it. How, what are we going to do in 10 years when Social Security is gone, too? We got to plan for that as well. And you know how it is. You go to a meeting and you sit down and we all talk about things and we get up and leave and nothing we talked about ever gets done. How many times have you done that? Tonight you probably talk about something you're going to do. Human nature, not blaming anybody here, I do the same thing. You get up and leave and forget about it. I'm not going to forget about this. I'm here for two years to drive everybody nuts. Unless she doesn't, Heather doesn't renew my contract. <laughs> Which might happen, who knows? <laughs> so Amanda can explain the numbers. Back this up a little bit. Oops. That's okay, I can get it after. Okay, so the documents that I gave you all, and you guys all have it on your iPads. 
is describing the 10 year plan that we have put together as an estimate. I just want to make sure that's clear. This is the best I can get to with an estimate using our current CBA, the collective bargaining agreement. I first created an estimated wage schedule because this current contract that our officers are covered under expires in FY19, at the end of FY19. So I used what they currently have, which is a 2% each year um, for their cost of living, and I just projected that out. I left it the same, so I don't know what that will be based on their bargaining agreement in 10 years. I have no idea what that will look like, but I tried to give somewhat of an idea of what the wages could be. Um, we varied through shifts, so I went started adding an officer um, night, evening, day, and I just we just rotated through that, based using same estimations for their um, shift differential. You have a summary which goes over each officer for every year, adding it out, and then I have detail sheets, so that just breaks down everything that I that you have in front of you. One of the biggest numbers that we have um, to figure out is their overtime. So that's where we cover when an officer is out sick, you know, we have to cover their shift. So that comes out of their overtime account. So we use an average of every officer receives five sick days when they start. So we start there and then we've looked at um, what they usually use, it's around nine days per officer on an average. I mean, if someone's out injured, that's a separate item. But on average, they use about nine days. So I tried to estimate that at an overtime rate. Most of the overtime rates are estimated at the patrolman wage. It could vary whether there's a sergeant that's on board covering the shift or a reserve. I tried to use like the middle of the road. Um, personal is covered in the same way. We assume an average of eight days. Um, and then vacation, I went based on what their current contract allowances are. Holiday coverage, again, that's another thing that's covered in their agreement. I calculated that out. Um, I used the current uniform rate. That could change. Uh, with a new agreement and another one of the big things is education incentive the town currently gives the officers um, a certain amount of money per their for if they have a degree I assumed in my estimations that they had a bachelor's degree because they could have no degree they could have an associates or um, a master's so I just sort of went middle of the road to give somewhat of a number saying we did an estimate based on the current state requirements for different various trainings so that's a broad overview of how the numbers came from. And then the summary just sort of adds it all up, going out to the 10 years. So if you're going all the way out to 10 years, adding one officer each year for 10 years, that gets you to <coughs> four year 10, 2028 would be $1,042,000 as a total. And that's my broad overview. Any questions from the finance uh, committee? Just a just a comment. I think the uh, the numbers as presented um, make sense. I think it's very detailed. I think your assumptions are reasonable. Um, it, it's uh, it's a big number, um, but I think the detail that you have to support it uh, gives us confidence that um, the numbers are uh, more than directional. Uh, they they give us a, a good basis for deciding whether this is something we can afford, not whether this is something we can afford, but how we figure out a way to afford it. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, John? Oh, I'd, I'd just like to echo that, the very detailed chief. Really, uh, I like the, uh, like, like, like the, the operation of detail. You and I talked as well about the fact that there's gonna be, for the 10 officer ads, there's going to be a couple more patrol cars needed. Is that right? Yeah. You know, when does that uh, when does that kick in? So I, I know you had some cushion on that. Uh, it would likely kick in around fiscal 22. Okay. So fiscal 20, I'll have a spare car. If I get say, if this thing for whatever reason we're able to find some of it. I get two more officers by say 22, mm -hmm. I'll probably need another car. And then by 25 or 26, I'll need another car. Okay. Right, so you're saying every time you have a, a, yeah, a yeah. night, evening, day, you need it. You know. Right, exactly. So yes. Increase yes. by three guys, yep. or I need another car. That's right. why okay. I had another done it that way. Car. Right, and that's what makes it very clear. Uh, so is Amanda going to be presenting next year at budget time? If you'd like. 
Actually, wow, we're always happy to see you. And I, and I, I also wanted to say, of, of, of the six years that I've been on the Finance Committee, the, the presentation has always been great. The need has always been clear. Um, and if there's a way to move forward on this, I, I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I think we need to find that way. Mm -hmm. so. And the, the only suggestion I would make, uh, it's not within your budget, but uh, putting in the cost for health insurance for the additional people going on in that part and uh, the, the pension costs, uh, just as another thing of what, what the total cost is. I, I think this is, is a very reasonable thing that we should have done many years ago, but we can't go back. They say, when's the best time to plant a tree, 20 years ago or today? So today <laughs> is when we have to deal with this. Um, and I think that when we start talking about new growth of, of a possible way of funding it, which when you fund new projects with new growth, it means you don't have that available to do for other things. So there'll be some balancing going on at that point. Okay, Mr. Chair, may I make a comment? Yes. Okay, when I got involved in town government, it was for public safety. And so in order or to advocate for funding for public safety, and when I did that, I went back and I, I studied as many years back as I could easily go and one of the things I did was not only attend all the finance committee meetings last well I guess it was two years ago now but I would watch the YouTubes for the previous years as far back as they went and it, it was really almost not a waste of my time but it's the exact thing that has been said and so it does feel like wheel spinning at this point having studied it in a condensed way for many many years and what I would do also is it was based on an incident at our school that I was, you know, started advocating for the funding, but would look at what other communities did because it really falls down to retroactive funding versus proactive funding. And if you study communities that have something very serious happen in them, and then you, ch it, it was hard to kind of dial back and do, but the one that stuck with me the most was Sandy Hook. What did they do the following fiscal year? And they upped their, um, I think their police budget by $400,000 just for staffing and that was that was to that was a retroactive funding to put people there that they actually no longer needed because they weren't able to help for that actual event so it was just almost like a symbolic gesture and that I made one big like four score and seven years ago public comment about how you can't really always justify the spending because it's a proactive process for community to be ready and I can't think of a better place where we should try to spend our money and I think it's sad that there's years worth of wheel spinning to get caught up. And I think I would be stealing from something you said maybe this year in finance committee meeting, Chief Marino, that we'll continue to be behind because our population is still growing. So even if we get caught up to where we should be today, 10 years from now, we're probably still behind anyways. So I think that this should be a huge priority for the town. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, Sandy hopes that that's a good example of the police department not being properly prepared. Fortunately, they didn't. I don't think they they uh, experienced a ton of criticism. But look at this sheriff down in Florida. I don't want to be that person when, when something like that happens. And you know, we can't afford to say, "Well, it can't happen to us." It's just not. That's not in our wheelhouse where I come from. Not in my building. And we have to be prepared for anything. I've seen. Um, as a you know, man is new to this, so I say to the store all the time, you know, I mean, uh, just give me a minute because I'm writing this down. It's going in my memoirs. I could write a book. Uh, and this is a small town. I can't even imagine what it's like to work in a larger community. And she's already seen and uh, been exposed to some really horrible things. Uh, one more recently, within a week ago, uh, one of the most horrible things I've ever seen. I won't, and I can't even talk about it yet, but I would. Uh, but these things happen, they don't happen every day. Um, you're going to see a decline in our arrest rate this year. Well, probably because I have three guys out injured for a good part of the year. Uh, so my staffing level is way below what it should be. Uh, even now, you're going to see a decline in ticket writing. Not because they're not out writing, you see them out on Lake Castor Up and trying to do direct the patrols now, trying to address all the concerns of the residents. However, it's hard to write cars now because the traffic is so heavy, they're all streaming along at the same speed, which is usually not, usually the speed limit because of the congestion. And we're having the same issue in Lindenburg. 
we're seeing a decline at uh, levels I've never seen before in, uh, in these kinds of incidents because of the traffic levels. So all that stuff's gonna change our numbers. It doesn't mean anything to me. I could come in here next year, and you know we had 686 arrests uh, two years ago, and now we're down to 300. Uh, three years from now, it's gonna skyrocket again. You know, we don't know. We gotta be prepared. But thanks for listening to me tonight. And again, I, I'm a little wound up, so I hope I didn't offend anybody. If I just may? Sure. Um, just to give you a little background on the development of these plans and how this came about. So when I came a year and a half ago, after meeting with all the department heads, about two weeks into the job to develop the budget, both chiefs implicitly said, you know, we've been asking for years for additional staff. We really need additional staff. And we made that happen for fiscal 18. We made it happen for fiscal 19. And it was, they actually came to me about a written plan, which I thought was a great idea. And I wanna thank them for putting all the effort as well as Amanda and Karen, because it took a lot of time to do that. And I think it's a good plan that we need to see how we can implement. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I think that tonight's review did exactly what we had expected it to, is to, is to consolidate all this information, put it in front of us, we've seen it before, but also to put it in front of the town. Uh, I don't think anybody disagrees that concentrating on public safety, both fire and police, as the town grows is a critical objective, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of how do we pay for it. And, it, and I, I, I like what uh, Mr. Erickson said, it's, it's let's figure out how, not if. Uh, and that's our job. Any other? Sure. Yeah, I, I have a question for Amanda. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do, do, do we have access to like revenue forecasting models? We do a financial forecast every year. Yes. How, how far into the future can you sort of hedge? Um, well, our model is five years. You could project longer, but you know those numbers, I wouldn't trusts really beyond five years. I mean, you can do a 10-year forecast, but. Okay. It's sort of like a sort of struggle here, mm -hmm. just not knowing how the numbers, <clears throat> like a million dollars spent over the next six or seven years. Does that chunk change when it comes to overall growth? Um, I, I don't know what that, mm -hmm. what that picture is, or how do you sort of like connect the two together? Yeah. I did do a, uh, preliminary input of both um, the 10-year plan for the fire department, I'm mean, a police department, and four-year plan for the fire department, as well as health insurance, the additional health insurance that would be required for all the positions. And um, there, obviously there's gonna be shortfalls in those years with those projections, because there's certain assumptions built into the other numbers. Um, as you know, percentage increases for motor vehicle excise and other local receipts or uh, health insurance, what it's gonna increase every year, retirement and so on. What was the new growth this year? Um, the number that we used was 375. So our new growth, we won't know until the fall. But it's been running three, 400,000 a year? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, there was also within the last 10 years, if you go that far back, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I mean, you, you just look at who's coming through the planning board for um, permits um, to see what's coming in the short term. And I think the other piece of the discussion that hasn't happened yet is one of the things that we were asked to come to talk about was um, taxing to the, to the limit, the two and a half limit. And if that's already factored into the five year projections, what happens if we don't do that? So um. that's, a, that's a pretty good segue. I, I'm, I'm not sure we can explore that as deeply as we might like to, but it is our, on our agenda. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about our philosophy about taxing to the levy limit. It, it, it's something that we wanted to do while we had you folks with us. I think, I think when we've talked about it, for the most part, um, it's come up as a, we really need to be 
talking about it, but on the, on the other hand, we so far haven't been able to address all the unmet needs. And I think for some of us, the, the question is, do we set a target for something like that, not knowing that we haven't addressed unmet needs? And it could, because certainly we have heard the, the public safety um, departments, and we have, you know, so there's, so if you want to set a policy around um, what we're going to do, um, I, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure which objectives you want to set first. If you want to set that we have unmet needs that we want to see if we can't address, and if we can't address them without taxing to the limit, then we go ahead and tax to the limit because that's what we can do. I mean, I, I don't know um, if anybody else has any other feelings on that. Again, it's not something that we've talked about because there hasn't been really a discussion around whether or not there's a, we're ready, we're, I don't even, personally, I don't feel like we're anywhere near ready to talk about it. Again, just because we've been listening to several years of unmet needs. Um, and I think as we start to see um, the, the debt service come down um, and maybe a little bit more flexibility in the operating budget, but I also don't know if the, one of the reasons why we have debt services, stuff comes up. So I don't know um, beyond um, looking at a five-year projection, you know, like maybe identifying someplace in there, is there room for that? But if the Board of Selectmen determines that they want to accept and address the plans that were put forward tonight, I, you know, I don't know if anybody else sees a way through, but I, you know, I, don't, I don't see how we can find the money if we're reducing the amount of money we're taking in. That, but that's just my opinion. Um, it feels to me like we just assume we're gonna increase it two and a half percent every year and no one, no one ever thinks about, well, maybe we don't have to. Maybe we can try uh, raising the levy limit just two percent. You know, just reduce it by a half a percent. You know, I think it's a state of mind. You you can increase it to a half percent, so you do. Our taxes have gone up 30 percent since 2014. That's too much for a lot of people who've lived here for a long time. Yes, they have. Oh no, I'm I'm not questioning it, but I'm also just thinking some of that is debt above the, that right. has nothing to do yeah. with the two and a half. Right. Well, not that Some of that. nothing to do with it, but Well, it, no, I mean that basically cumulative. it's not factored into the two and a half percent increase, the right. school loans and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what I'm thinking when, you know, that was just me thinking, that wasn't a. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, I just think, assuming we're gonna um, tax to, I mean, I remember the first time I really thought about it was when Mark asked the town manager, do we have to increase the level, tax the levy limit every year, and the automatic answer was yes. Like, gee, I don't know, should we think about this? Is, you know, is there a way to think about this differently? Can we think outside of the box? Can we try to tighten our belts? You know, people get raises more than two and a half percent. The school committee on the, the last union contract, they increased the, the teachers pay so the the school budget is going to increase by a million dollars over three years we can't keep doing that the school committee needs you know I every everybody says well you know if the school committee spends their money on that then they're not going to be able to get other things that's not going to happen they're going to increase they're going to have all of this payroll and then they're going to say well geez the class size is too big we need to hire more teachers we need more programs we need more technology they're already taking 70% of the town's budget. We have to stop and start thinking, what can we afford? Um, in the other towns that I've lived and worked, the town manager and someone from finance committee was involved in the school, the teacher contract negotiations. This, the school needs stronger limits. You know, we, th we just don't have all of the money in the world, and I think we have to start thinking more strongly about tightening budgets. Hannah? So I have a question. Um, when we're giving out money to every department, and I know all the departments need them, a certain amount for certain things, is there a way to tighten up? There is just a little bit, and I'm not trying to be like to give more just to them, but 
until we can try to maybe speed up the process because from the sound of it we're going to be screwed really come 10 years like it's we're going to be in the same spot and i've been on finance committee going on three years and it is it's just rerun and rerun and rerun and it's anno it's annoying <laughs> to hear the same thing and it stinks that we're just sitting here and we can't give it all i mean i would love to do that to everybody but is there just a way of is there any bylaws saying like we have to give so much to this department this department this department or can we try to tighten them up just a tiny bit more and I don't want to overlook all the hard work that everyone's done believe me I really appreciate it and I know it's a lot but I'm just wondering if there's maybe some give and take that we can do that we can hold off on something from Department of Public Works or the school committee or or, or the school system I said um, just anything to kind of gear it so that goes a little faster for safety so, so there's no rule no town meeting votes whatever they want to vote and okay. so when we go through the town the town man the town uh, moderator says if you want to have a question put hold on that line item yep what that's gone through is the process of the town manager working with all the departments and giving a target number for the school saying don't go over this amount otherwise there's going to be an issue is sort of like how it starts and then it comes to you as the finance committee and the public process at that and then there's a little flurry just before town meeting with adjustments within but there's not major adjustments okay it uh, seems to me but 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 part of the thing that goes on is that we have been using new growth to support what i would consider operational growth and new growth cannot be guaranteed new growth is a result of new development now we're going to have new development for a while because the economy is booming at the moment. At some point, that's going to stop. And if we assume that our operation is going to grow based on the new growth, we've got an issue as opposed to, I personally believe the 2.5% is a reasonable growth inflation factor. I think what would be helpful is going back over prior years and actually getting inflation numbers, the consumer price index, so we can say, all right, this year we went up 2.5%. Forget about new growth. But consumer price index was only one percent okay why did we go up more did we fund something that was effectively a new growth item another we did another dpw truck at this point or something else like that so there's that process of comparing that part you know I, i'll do the history lesson again before prop two and a half there was no limit to what we could raise on taxes and in fact that's why so many people came to town meeting is because that's when you stopped spending now people know two and a half percent plus new growth new growth is not going to affect my taxes because it's on somebody else's taxes we've got that forever my taxes are only going to go up two and a half percent if you can accept that you don't go to town meeting before we had more people come now what we're going to do is we need to come up and get people to come to town meeting and say this is where i want the money spent you know this is what mrs luck is talking about is where should we be spending our money we need to have that dialogue and it could be instead of you know the fear factor of no 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 two and a half percent what is a half a percent impact and where would that be cut and then you have that discussion you know we're going to cut here we're going to cut here we're not going to do this additional position so i think we should have that dialogue i personally believe that it's not realistic not to have that two and a half percent but we need to ask it every year i agree with that question yeah. and, and i don't think in this budget process we had any budget discussions you know from the moment the town we didn't dis discuss it before the town manager presented her budget we didn't discuss it after the town manager presented her budget there was one fabulous idea for adding ems and we didn't even discuss that you know it, it took town meeting to um fund that so we are once once the town manager sets her budget everybody it's rigid so we have to have these discussions in november we have to start talking about it earlier before it gets to the point where people go, well, I don't really, you know, the town manager uh, presented this budget, so we can't, you know, mess with that. I mean, it's, yeah, we, we can. never had a discussion about the budget. And Sorry, I've if, I, if yeah, I might. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. I, I'd like to provide a little bit of a history lesson as well. Uh, I've been on the finance committee for nine years. Uh, so in 2009, when I first joined, we were cutting budgets. We were looking for areas of cutting services, and that went on for half of my tenure. In the last half of my tenure, we've started the discussion of where can we add services. 
we've had this notion of a level service budget and then and that was the target and then above target requests and we started evaluating above target requests for the first four and a half or five years it was we were still cutting and we tend to forget about that uh, so yes we're in a better place today uh, but let's remember remember where we've been uh, we, we had some very deep cuts uh, going back in, in chief you know that oh, yeah. uh, you've been impacted by that um, we're finally now putting services back in and getting back um, not just to where we were but even a little bit uh, above that yeah and that's but only true in haul. some cases right because actually some of the new positions that are put in are replacing positions that had been taken out right so um and i think that's one of the other reasons why we end up at a status but anyway but that's just we've also that. had uh significant change, changes in state funding yes uh, state funding is is not as high as it as it once was uh as a percent of the town's revenues uh, and that's a factor we don't have full control over that uh, I, but good. Okay. I was just going to comment on if we're going to have a discussion about not taxing to levy, it has its implications, obviously. It means cuts. We won't be able to add additional staff. It's going to impact the capital plan because we use a, a part of our levy towards the capital plan. And where I foresee that we're finally making strides in the capital plan. So this past year, we uh, use 768,000 and raise an appropriation funds towards capital plan to help buy a new ladder truck and all other capital things ha had gone on um, purchase for so many years. And um, I think it would also impact the ability to address the deferred maintenance of our facilities that we're just getting a handle on. So those are all implications that we need to consider when not taxing to the levy. And if you look at the tax rate, the forecasted tax rate for fiscal 19, without including the debt exclusions, the percent, the uh, increase is 37 cents in the tax rate without the debt exclusions. But how can you exclude the debt exclusion? I'm saying take those out of the equation because we can't change the debt exclusion numbers. Those are gonna automatically be added on to the tax rate. So if we don't tax to the levy, that's the base tax rate. Then you add on the debt exclusion amounts, which is approximately $2.14 on top of the tax rate. So that's where bulk of our tax rate increase is coming from. From the debt exclusion. <laughs> I just, everyone wants lower taxes, but the same people who say, why are my taxes so high, will also kick back and say, why don't we have nice things? And you can't have it both ways. I mean, I, I understand, when I first got involved with town politics, we were still in that cutting phase and we didn't have any money. It took a while to get to level funding and now we're finally talking about increasing funding. And I mean, we're starting, we look 10 years out and like, how do you know when, within that 10 years we're not gonna be cutting again? But seeing that giant number 10 years out, there's no reason not to start this year and you know, fund things like other officers or firefighters that we can do now and be cognizant of that big scary number out there but not use that as a non-starter for you know funding these things now when we have the opportunity to and I just as much as I like to see my taxes not go up I mean I, I realize there's a need for certain things and I don't know who you tell they're getting a cut I, I don't know who in this room could stand up and say to somebody that you're getting a cut and be able to defend why you're cutting their budget I just think it's a state of mind. I think you have to start thinking about it. It bothers me that it's an automatic. We have to tax to the levy limit every year. I, I think you, you give people raises that are more than two and a half percent. You do. You spend money where you don't have to spend money. Where, where do we spend money where we don't have to spend money? Though I mean, it's and we're obviously behind on, on staffing of departments that need staffing. So how? The fact that we're behind, in my mind, is a reason enough to keep taxing to the limit because we need to catch up. No. To me. 
I don't know. I, I, I really <laughs> think we have to have the discuss, this discussion, and I'm really glad we're having it tonight, and, and I think we need to have more budget discussion. Sure, sure. yeah. The, the, one, the one thing I feel is going to help, and it doesn't create money where money doesn't exist. It, there's never going to be enough money. But since, since I started getting involved in this, the one thing that I think has improved is that all of these exercises, whether it be debt exclusion, whether it be capital planning, whether it be budgeting, has changed its horizon to be more long term. Yes. We're looking 10 years, we're looking mm -hmm. 15 years. We now are aware that the debt exclusion number dips a little bit in 23. We never looked at that kind of stuff before. We looked at the next town meeting and what, yeah. what could we get pushed through and how many people could we get to support the one thing that was real important to us. And I think it's our job to lay out, as we've asked all the people that are here tonight to do, is a longer term plan yes. that takes us to adequate staffing or adequate capital or whatever. And to me, it's, there's not much of a difference between taxing to the levy, having a debt exclusion, or having an override. At the end of the day, taxes are taxes. If it's part of a long, -run, long range plan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if we got on an objective to say we're not going to go to the levy limit, but when somebody has a great idea, we're going to do a debt exclusion. Yeah, same, no, same thing. Right, right. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I like the fact that we're thinking more long term. There's not a magic answer. We don't have enough money to do everything in, in, to, to respond to what Mr. Mm -hmm. McQuaid said. We don't have enough money to do everything that everybody wants to do right. and lower our taxes. But I, I appreciate you brought that up. I don't think it should be automatic. I think we should consciously have a strategy. I think the Finance Command Committee should be commended on the fact that they've put in procedures and processes and percentages to mm -hmm. say, we don't want debt to be more than this percent. We don't want operating expense to be more than that percent. Right. We don't want, you know, that's good. That gives us more roadmaps to begin to do our long range planning. And when we do the long range planning, we really have to include everything. You know, the fire trucks, the boats, the whatever, you know, everything needs to be in there or it's not a usable plan. And, and I think while it can always be improved, the town manager's process of target budgets and, and above target requests avoids the let's bring a crowd to town hall and try to steal from another department to, to fund our pet project, regardless of what it is. And I think the, the other thing that, that I think is good because that the town manager has done is asking for what's not a level funded. So the fact that, as, as Katie was talking about, that the repeat story about additional firefighters, additional police officers, at least it is on the record, as maybe it's the over and over again. Um, I think we need to do that with the school as well. Um, I volunteered to be on the school superintendent screening committee as a committee member and I was lucky to be selected. Um, they had 30 candidates that we selected 10 to interview, uh, one withdrew, uh, we picked three, one withdrew at that point, they're in the process of interviewing the remaining two. And one of the things I was struck with when they asked various questions, because we went through a process of making sure we asked the questions that elicited innovation, creativity, one of the questions is, how do you deal with a tough budget because there's never enough money? They would ask, do you do the following? And around the room, they would say, no, we don't. Do you do the following? No, we don't. So there are things that the school should be doing to be an innovative school district that are not there because they have to live within their budget. So the question is, what are the things that we're not doing in the school, what are we not doing in the fire and the police and other things like that? And I'm not saying that we should be increasing the budget, but we should know what they believe they should do in every department, not just so that they, you know, here's what we asked for and they cut our budget. No, your budget's still going up by a certain amount. You're not getting as much as you asked for. And I think that would be an important discussion for town meeting to actually have it. There's been a few years now we've not had a full presentation of the school budget at town meeting which is when sometimes it's the first time that the town has a chance to look at the school budget. We've looked at it, the finance committee has looked at it, the town managers looked at it. Even though town meeting doesn't get to line item, cut something out, <coughs> I remember the discussions of how many teachers we have, what's the percentage. Now if you go to the school committee uh, budget hearing, which Mrs. Luck goes to, you will hear that. 
and, and I've gone to some of that stuff, but I think that it's, it doesn't get out to the full public of what is our education plan for the next five years. Now, you're going to have a new superintendent coming in. <laughs> Hopefully, they, they pick somebody good and they accept the job, and they get to do their first budget right away. So that will be a, a new process, a new discussion that everybody gets to ask, well, what is the school budget, which for just about my entire life has been about 70% of the budget because it is almost all personnel and that's what it's going to be. So I think additional discussions, um, earlier discussions, um, as, as Mrs. Luck has talked about, uh, I think is a good thing. Um, but we won't be able to do everything we want to do. Okay, can we wrap this up for tonight? Or does anybody have any final? I just got a comment. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I tossed this idea around, just throwing it out there. You look scared. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking about this year, this coming budget season, when I finished the budget and so forth. I mean, whatever, the preliminary budget. I was thinking of having like a kind of a coffee with the chief at night and invite the public in to talk about my budget, any questions they might have or concerns. And I was thinking about maybe inviting, you know, some of you people and finance committee, whoever can make it. You know, just a, an hour, a two hour forum or something. If people show up, they show up, they don't, they don't. But I, I thought that was an idea I had. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know what you think about that and something to think about. I think budget discussions are always a good idea. I think so. And er earlier the better. Mark? You don't have to push no. it. No. It was on. This one. Okay. So I'm new to the finance committee, so I enjoyed now learning the last seven months a little bit how the town works. Um, over the last three weeks, I tried to get an understanding how uh, town spendings are in similar sized communities in the area. Because when I looked at the first budget, yeah, the school budget here seemed for me very high. So I wanted to understand a little bit what are we doing different here in some of the areas. The police and firemen budget is very low compared to other to other cities and I try to currently gather a little bit an understanding what the difference is, where we are missing opportunities and maybe where we are also overspending. And something I hope I can do in maybe one, two months is just do a little presentation about some of the findings just to get an idea and maybe have a different mindset. Thank you. I like that idea. I like that idea. <laughs> Great. Change is good. Great. Invite us. <laughs> Be well. well. I'd like to thank the uh, Finance Committee. I think this was very meaningful and very good. Appreciate it. And I'd like to thank the Chiefs and their staffs for the work that they've done. This is, this is very important. Thank you. So, Chief, did you bring up tomorrow afternoon at all? Did, did you want to before? You know? Oh. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not the Finance Committee, and it's not our public comment. I guess I'll just take a motion to adjourn from the Finance Committee. <laughs> Second. And just basically anybody on the Finance Committee who's now leaving, don't, don't miss the car show tomorrow afternoon at Memorial Drive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nobody said no. Yeah. Jeff, are your testifying offices going to be available tonight or not? Uh,
two rounds. Two rounds. Right. Okay. Should go. Okay. Yeah, I think we're gonna go ahead and do the hearing then as long as she's here, right? All right. What we're gonna do is uh, go back to our 705 Wicca license violation hearing for J and M. And uh, let me just cover what we normally do. The normal process is for us to have an official hearing uh, where everyone testifying would be sworn in. The uh, complainant, which is the town, and the police officer would be sworn in. Uh, the town would present testimony, the license holder or a representative would be sworn in and respond to that testimony or present testimony. The board would ask questions and deliberate. Board makes a finding and the board determines if there's a finding uh, of a violation that if, if there's a penalty and what that penalty would be. Uh, is there anybody here from the license holder? Seeing none, I'd like to call the uh, complainant, the town of Lunenburg Police Department up. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I probably should read the hearing notice, which is... Okay. This was addressed to MIG Inc. doing business as J&M Sports Bar, sent certified mail on May 10th, 2018. Uh, RE alcohol Alcoholic Beverage License number 00047-GP0636 MIJ Inc. Notice of Hearing. Dear Ms. Thibodeau, on June 5th, 2018 at 7.05 p.m., the Lunenburg Board of Selectmen will hold a hearing pursuant to MGL Chapter 138, Section 64, to discuss your alcoholic beverage license at, at 5 Summer Street, Unit 10, Lunenburg. The hearing will be held in the Joseph Pallotta Meeting Room, Second Floor Town Hall, 17 Main Street, Lunenburg. The hearing will concern the April 17th 2018 incident report followed by the Lunenburg Police Department and received by the Board of Selectmen on April 25th, 2018, a true copy of which is enclosed. You may attend this hearing and be represented by counsel at your own expense if you wish. The allegation, if proven, may constitute the following violations of Lunenburg License Commission regulations. 1.03, admission to the premises, J, licensees shall not lock the front door of the premises until the last patron has exited from the premises, and K, licensees shall not allow any patron or any guest or any employee who is not working that shift to enter the premises after the closing hour posted on the license or prior to the opening hour posted on the license. And 1.04a, hours of operation. The hours of operation shall be restricted to those set by the licensing authority and stated on the face of the license. No patron shall be on the premises before the official opening hours or after the official closing hours. Last call is a minimum of 30 minutes prior to closing time. Customers must be up and out once the closing hour of the license premises is reached. 1.13. Other causes for revocation, suspension, and modification. A, one, violation of the license of any provision of the relevant general laws of the Commonwealth, Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 12, and of the regulations of the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission or of the regulations of the licensing authority. These allegations, if proven, would constitute grounds for disciplinary action, including a written warning, suspension, revocation, or a decrease in operating hours of your license per section 1.14A to D of the Lunenburg License Commission regulations. Due to the fact that you have had four violations occur within the last two years, a fifth offense would be subject to a range of warning to revocation of the license. If you have any questions, please contact this office. Sincerely, Heather Lemieux, Town Manager. Okay, now I need to swear in the officer. Okay, would you raise your right hand please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Thank you. Would you identify yourself and give your testimony? My name is Kayla Ledger. I'm a full-time police officer with the Lunenburg Police Department. I work the 11-7 shift. Um, do you want me to just read the please. report? All right. 
On April 17, 2018, I, Officer Ledger, was working a uniformed 11P to 7A patrol shift in Mark Cruiser 217 for the town of Lunenburg. At approximately 2.04 a.m., Officer Campbell, who was working in Marked Cruiser 212, called out he had seen someone inside the J&M sports bar. I arrived on scene to assist. Officer Campbell informed me that he saw a person with a white t-shirt walk by the side door as he was driving by the building. We looked into the front window and we were able to see a pair of shoes on the ground, a jacket on the bar, and a jacket on a bar stool. There were four plastic cups on the bar. Officer Campbell and I uh, knocked on the door, announcing who we were and telling the parties inside to come to the door. They did not respond. There were three vehicles in the lot at this time. One vehicle bearing Mass Reg 4 HA853 was parked in a handicap spot outside the uh, side door without any visible, visible handicap placards being displayed. The second vehicle bearing Mass Reg 5YN517 was parked behind the building blocking half the road and the third vehicle was parked off, the, off to the side in a legal parking spot bearing Mass Reg 7GBN70. After knocking several times, we informed the parties inside that uh, the illegally parked vehicles would be towed if they were not moved. Melissa Thibodeau, date of birth 12775, came to the door wearing a white t-shirt and no shoes. She seemed surprised and asked us what we wanted. We be she began to tell me that she was us, that she was finishing up some of the things at the bar and that the male party later identified as Aaron Storm, date of birth 61484, was her ride. After entering the building, it was clear that the two had been hanging, in the, hanging out there for a while. There was smoke in the room, and there was a distinct odor of burnt marijuana and cigarettes in the room. Aaron said he was unaware that the bar did not have a license past call 45 and immediately left the building, making no comments about being Melissa's ride or even offering her a ride at this time. Officer Camp Campbell told Melissa to get her belongings and go home as well. Thank you. Are there any questions? Was one, was, were one of the cars hers? Uh, she had a rental car there, which was in the handicap spot, and the one legally parked off to the side was her personal vehicle. The one in the back was Mr. Storms. And um, so she drove, she, she left and drove home? Yes. I'm sorry, I missed what time was that at? 2 a.m. 2.04 was the initial call out. And I'd like the record show that the licensee is not present or represented. Although they did receive the notice by. It was sent regular and certified. And they did not show up for one of our previous hearings. I'm not sure which one, but I think perhaps the first one. Could you. Um, did you have a sense of what state of sobriety they were in at the time? Um, they did not seem to be intoxicated where we wouldn't let them drive away from the scene. Mm -hmm. um, we, the cups were empty on the bar, but they, there definitely was still a scent of burnt marijuana um, in there, but there's no way of telling how much THC is in their system at that yeah. point. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, yes. um, this is my first um, hearing for this bar as a selectman, but I've been to all of them as a, a guest. <laughs> um, so I think we should start. I'm, so I went back and studied everything and read everything, you know, just to, to, to fill in the gaps. And there's actually an Excel spreadsheet of violations, and I find that appalling. So I guess I'd like to start there. Mm -hmm. I think by the time you have an Excel spreadsheet of your liquor license violations, it's it's a much larger problem than this specific incident and and I would note that the the three proposed uh, violations are admission to the premises not locking the door until the last patron is exited which is not the owner but the other party not allow any patron or guest uh, who's not working to enter the premises after the closing hour we don't know about the entering but they clearly were in there hours of operation um, they're uh, no patrons before the official closing or after the official closing hours. So there's a violation of that. Uh, I'm not clear about other causes for revocation, suspension, or modification uh, other than that it might be the smell of marijuana. Um, and if that was, that in, since it would not be done for medicinal use in that location, um, I would think that there would be a finding on that. 
No, I would make a motion that we find that there is a violation of 1.03 admission to the premises, locking the front door uh, prior to the last patron leaving and not a, and allowing a patron to be on in the property that's not working. Violation of the hours of operation. Uh, no patron shall be on the premises after the closing hours, which was 2 o'clock. Uh, and then uh, 1.13, other that first one, the second one was 1.04. A, hours of operation, then 1.13 other causes of op revocation uh, due to the violation of other uh, general laws, that being the uh, uh, marijuana consumption on site. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on whether there was a violation or not? All those in agreement with this violation, please say aye. 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 Now we're in the deliberation of penalty phase. So I'll channel Mrs. Bertram when she was very upset when we had the violation and they didn't show up and it was a serious situation. Um, I will echo Katie's comment about uh, the number that are on here. Um, for a while we were just doub doubling the suspensions by, by days, doubling and doubling. The last one was not as serious a violation, but uh, I, I'd be leading towards a revocation. The, the only extenuating circumstance here, and I don't even think it applies as a, an excuse, is that if you look at the spreadsheet, the violations occur prior to the hearings so that they're stacked up so close to each other and on top of each other that they've had so many violations where they created the violation on April 17th before they even have appeared before us on May 8th. And it kind of goes back that way through several of them. I think we were pretty uh, serious last time that we, we didn't want to see them again, but this violation occurred before we did that. Having said that, I, I don't disagree that I've, I've seen enough history here that I don't believe that they're capable of managing their establishment. Yeah, and if I may, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I just like, I think starting from a fresh perspective and just even reading the liquor license bylaws and then thinking of myself as part of something new, which is a licensing authority, we give out a limited number of these, and I just, I don't feel, I mean, again, they're not even here. And I, I just don't understand how, I think of it like as a mom when, you know, if, if, if you don't set an example for what it means to have a liquor license, then what does this mean for anybody else and their violations? It's that they can keep making them with no consequence. What are the implications of a revocation? Um, if they wanted to come back to us before, they would have to file an entirely new application. Would they be entitled to it if they were had a revocation? I'm not sure. I think they would appeal to the ABCC first. Decision. The other, the other alternative would be to give a suspension for a 30-day period, which is a, which is pretty substantial for a business. Another thing I was wondering is if um, changing the time, because I know when their attorney said it was dangerous at 1245, perhaps they can close at 10 p.m. I don't know. I know that setting the hours of operation is part of the license, and maybe that's another way to change the way it's operating. I, I believe that we're the local, we're the local licensing authority, but ABCC is the state licensing authority, and I would... I would venture to say that I'm in favor of a revocation and, and let them appeal it to ABCC and, and see where they come down. And if they reverse this or make a suggestion, I'd be willing to listen to it. It seems like, you know, August last year, January, February, March, and April, it's, it, it does not seem that there's been enough effort to run the business responsibly. I would make a motion that we revoke the license for MIJ Incorporated DBA J&M Sports Bar. Second. 
and they, that would be effective after the appeal time, or do, does that apply in this case? I don't think yeah. that. Do we have to give them the, the time like we, we do on a, a, on a, a suspension? Um, Can we revoke it effective immediately? Or? No, so they have five days to appeal once we send them the written receipt right. of the revocation. To be safe, I would move that we uh, revoke the license effective Friday, June 15th. It's a week from Friday. Is there a second? It's during the time that it's suspended already. Does that matter? Not to me. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Uh, I just, I, the pattern of behavior is certainly telling as far as the, uh, the way they operate the business down there. I don't take the decision to essentially take away someone's livelihood away lightly. Uh, it's not an easy decision to make. Uh, but I, I, before something more serious does happen, I think it's the right thing to do. Just so uh, I looked up what the next steps would be for them. Um, once they, uh, they have the five days to appeal, if the ABCC approves the lo uh, local licensing decision, they can appeal to superior court within 30 days of receipt of that decision. If the ABCC does not approve the local decision, then the local, dis local authority must carry out the recommended action by ABCC. And if they decide their, um, the local authority decides the original decision was correct and that they were in violation of license, they can reappeal to the ABC within five days of receipt of the decision. And Mr. Chair, one other comment is that I think when you watch other um, violations occur, people can be so reactive and so sincere to correcting it. And I think that's something to, to weigh in here is that you would at least be here if you, <laughs> if you were going to be reactive. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, officer. Okay, next item is the town manager report. So an update from a previous uh, report on 925 Mass Ave. Town Council has now been provided the information on this property in order to begin the process for petitioning the court for a right of entry. That's and that the, would start the, the process in order for a phase one assessment. That's the old gas station. Yes, the old gas station. And that doesn't obligate us in any way. It just gives us the ability to go do right. some homework. It's the necessary step to begin that process if we wish to proceed. Mm -hmm. The Summer Street Project, the engineering firm that the town has worked with on Summer Street Project, BHB, will do inspections and review submittals during the project. This will be um, some oversight on the town's side. The general contractor, Baltazar, has installed an the advanced warning signage for the project. The survey crew has been on site daily laying out baseline drainage structures and clearing limits. Baltazar will be spraying the invasive species plants on site next week. Once these plants have died off in approximately one week, Northern Tree, who is the clearing subcontractor, will be coming in to begin clearing operations. The anticipated start date for drainage work will be around mid-June. Drainage work will begin at the Fitchburg end of the project and proceed towards Lunenburg. Just as a reminder, the tax lien sale auction will be on June 13th at 1 p.m. and that's in this room, Town Hall. Due to payments and tax agreements, the total tax liens went from 28 to 22 as of May 29th. The current total of delinquent taxes, interests, and penalties accrued for these tax title properties is approximately 577,000 $611. On May 29th, the DPW director and I met with staff from our consultant Woodard and Curran to review the projects on the prioritization plan for the complete streets. And they did field work to get parameters and scope of work for each project area. Using industry standards accepted by MassDOT, Woodard and Curran will cost out each project and we anticipate them presenting to the Board of Selectmen at the June 19th meeting. 
At a meeting on February 5th with Senator Tran, he requested possible capital projects for, that were ready to go to be submitted for capital facilities, repairs, and improvements for the Commonwealth bond bill that the Senate would be filing that day. The list of projects I sent Senator Tran were ones that had been identified as part of the town's capital plan or related to the property condition assessments. It included 25,000 for the Eagle House HVAC system for the older section of the building, 27,000 for the repair of the handicap ramp at the town hall, 65,000 for the repair of the old section of the roof at the DPW, 40,000 for LED lighting at the library, 40,000 for a feasibility and cost estimation to demolish the old primary building, including hazardous materials assessment, cost of abatement and design for future use of the land, and 130,000 for the asbestos abatement and ceiling replacement at Turkey Hill Elementary School. The first five projects have been approved by the conference committee, and the last project for Turkey Hill is included in the state budget, which is the most likely to receive funding. If any of the projects that were funded at our annual town meeting as part of the fiscal 19 capital plan are funded through the state, this will allow us this funding to be reappropriated towards other capital projects at a special town meeting in the fall. We will await the final decision by the state on whether these projects are funded and proceed from there. So that's, that's subject to possible, any uh, possible vetoes by the governor? Yes. Can he, does he have line item authority? For um, that, for the bond bill, I believe so. I believe if um, both the Senate and House had agreed on um, the budgets, there would least likely to be vetoed. They'd go through, but. Thank you. And I just wanted to um, make a comment um, about all the paving in town. I want to thank the DPW and the subcontractors for the work. There's been a number of positive comments um, that have been received through Facebook, people thanking the DPW for the work that's been done there and very happy with the outcome. Great. Thank you. Uh, our first item of current business is a letter of support for the submission of Section 319 grant. Mr. Bernie has been patiently waiting his time. <laughs> We got to get you earlier on the agenda every so often. I thought you guys just like to see me in the audience. <laughs> uh, so, at I guess it was two meetings ago. No, it was May twenty second. It was your last meeting. I came and and asked the board to consider writing a letter of support for the town's application for the three nineteen program. Um, the application has been submitted. Uh, we have until Friday of this week uh, at noon to submit additional letters of support from. Um, non-matching parties, Board of Selectmen being one of those is you folks aren't giving us any money or, or in-kind donations, uh, but what you are giving us is support as the uh, executive branch of government. Uh, and this grant program is for stormwater management. And it, it is mainly for impaired water bodies. Uh, but they've added some additional categories, one of which is the healthy watersheds. And so the town has decided to pursue the healthy watershed, which is the Upper Mulpus. Um, Hickory Hills Lake North uh, would be the Upper Mulpus, uh, out into the headwaters, which are up around Chase Road. And this would be the installation of nine best management practices at five locations. So multiple locations would have multiple best management practices. <coughs> and these would be in conjunction with pavement management at existing drainage and outfall locations. Uh, and the intent would be to uh, reduce the impact of the developed area on uh, the upper Mulpus, which is a cold water fishery. Uh, so that's the main task. Uh, inclusive in that is a repairing corridor planning project which would use a predefined uh, method for doing an assessment of the Mulpus Brook Riparian Corridor. Um, it's a visual inspection and there's a, a series of um, sections that would be viewed and, and graded uh, for what they are and it would give the, the town the ability to plan in the future how to continue to protect, maintain, and uh, increase the habitat. Uh, and there'd be a community and education outreach portion of it. 
which would, again, <clears throat> match up with some of our MS4 goals, uh, but wouldn't necessarily be part of our MS4 plan because this is an unregulated area. So it would allow us to educate the public on what the impacts are to the brook and the other areas uh, for uh, not doing some of these things or, or some of the other dangers to the cold water fishery and the, the existing habitat. And this is work we need to do anyway. Correct. Yes. I, I, you know, we're, we're probably going beyond the point of need to do, but it's all benefit to the community. This community has invested very heavily in uh, land conservation. A lot of that land conservation surrounds water bodies, specifically the Mulpus in this area. Um, the lane property encompasses a large length of Mulpus Brook. Um, the voted town meeting for the potential land swap, uh, such as it is on Gilcrest Street, again, furthers the protection of Mulpus Brook. Uh, this project would look at existing infrastructure and upgrading that existing infrastructure to sort of bolster and buttress that uh, land investment with infrastructure investment. Repairing a corridor, again, just gives us more planning tools, more ability to understand what's there and, and what we can do going forward that would be beneficial and what we should do, shouldn't do that would be detrimental. I would make a motion that we uh, authorize the chair to sign the letter in support of this grant application as submitted to us. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye in the Brook Trout, thank you. <laughs> All righty. The next item is our annual appointment list. And I'd like to start just by taking a look. There's a, there's a short spreadsheet that talks about positions that, for the most part, selectmen serve on, but there are some, uh, some exceptions. Capital planning, central uh, mass regional stormwater, charter review, finance committee appointing committee, MART advisory board, MMA voting member, MRPC, MJTC, MPO, stormwater task force, and Wor Worcester County Selectman Association. Um, so, let's see. Capital Planning Committee currently is uh, represented by Damon McQuaid. Damon, do you want to continue doing that? Uh, yeah, I'd really appreciate the opportunity to keep doing that. I think we've made some good progress. Um, it's, there's been a, kind of a lot of turnover on the board in the past year, so I think it'd be beneficial for me to stay if, if you guys would have me. Um, so. Anybody else want it or any objections to that? Nope, thank you for offering. Yes. Uh, Central Mass Regional Stormwater Coalition, Phyllis, you currently represent us. Do you want to continue doing that? Sure. Any objections or anybody else want to do that? Okay. Charter Review Committee, uh, there's two of us, myself and Mr. Ebersol. I'm, I'm interested in continuing. As I am. Anybody else interested? I would just say I'm interested, but I would defer to both of you. I'll be stepping down as the liaison to school committee, and I'll probably sometimes come as a member of the I would public. expect. <laughs> uh, finance committee appointing committee. I currently serve on that, uh, in that role. Comes up from time to time. I, I wouldn't mind continuing, but if someone else wants to do that, I have no objection. Okay. Uh, Mart Advisory Board, Phyllis, you currently do that? You want to continue to do that? I am happy to continue it, but I would certainly give it up if someone else would like to crack at it. Don't hear, don't hear any takers? Nobody wants to go on that bus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> MMA voting member, um, I, I currently fulfill that role. I, I, if I'm not going to go to any MMA thing, I would certainly notify anybody. To, to represent us, um, and I would also kind of check with all of you before I voted on Lunenburg's behalf, but I don't mind continuing doing that if it's okay. Uh, and, I'm sorry? Sure. 
MRPC, we, we don't have a representative on MRPC right now. I was wondering when they meet and how often. See, they currently meet the last Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. And nope, that changed January 2017 to the first Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. Okay, I have a volunteer to do that. Great. Super. Thank you. The MJTC. That's who what that's Paula had volunteered. Okay, now currently Michael Ray Jeffries represents the planning board or is he our representative? He was our um, representative. He was our representative, okay. Yes. That, that's the one that Paula volunteered to, to continue doing and I'm very much in support of mm -hmm. keeping Paula involved if nobody objects. No, no, I think it'd be great. Does she want to do the MPO too? Or I don't know that she volunteered for that. Okay. Uh, Does anybody have an interest to do an MPO? Julian. It's a really important. It's an important <laughs> role. It's how the TIP projects have um, been funded for Chase Road and Summer Street, going to those meetings. When do they meet and how often? Um, that I don't know, but I can find out. Um, I believe they're on Wednesdays. Why don't we... Why don't we leave that and, and we can double try, check and see if try Paula to, still try wants to encourage to you or Paula to represent us there. No, I, do, I just can't commit to something right. unless no. I know Understood. what it is. I'm Understood. Time wise. Uh, Stormwater Task Force, the ad hoc committee formed by the Board of Selectmen. Phyllis, you want to continue to represent sure. us there? Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to do mm -hmm. that instead? Good. And the Worcester County Selectmen's Association. Uh, that is primarily southern Worcester County, and they meet irregularly. I, I, I represent us in voting. Uh, Phyllis has gone once or twice. I'd actually like to this year see if we can get some towns in northern Worcester County to get involved, and then it might be a little more in interesting right. for us. But I don't mind keeping that until I accomplish that, unless anybody want, else wants it. Okay. So that's our committee assignments. Then we have. And just to let you know, the MPO last meeting was the third Wednesday of the month. It was a Wednesday. So I don't know. My Wednesdays might have just freed up. <laughs> <laughs> that was charter. Right. Mm. Right. And then we have our appointments that we make to various other committees. And there's a relatively long list there. Uh, how do we normally handle this? You read through the list and put a hold if we have a hold on anything, and otherwise we just approve it at one right. one shot. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, I need to read the selectmen's appointments first. Sure. Okay. Because there's also a town manager. Right. Okay. Animal control officer Kathy Como, architectural preservation district commission Brian. Corcoran, Agricultural Commission, there are two vacancies, Conservation Commission, Kenneth Jones, and Carl Luck. Do you want me to read their addresses? No, as well? okay. no unless somebody else feels okay. we need to do that. No. Okay. Clockwinders, Joseph Detton Ryder, George Martin, Louis Franco, Mike Kidney, Tom Alonzo, and William Tyler. Constables, Kevin Rice, Alan Parker and John Godek, Council on, on Aging, Elizabeth Dia Giacomo, Giacomo, Deborah Lincoln, and there's one vacancy as well. Cultural Council, Laura Brzezowski, Pete McCarran, Historical Commission, Rebecca Lantry, Richard McGrath, the Mart Advisory, uh, the board just did, Phyllis Luck. Montachusett Joint Transportation Committee, Paula Bertram. Montachusett Regional Planning Commission, vacant. Public Access Cable Committee, Faith Bial. Personnel Committee, there is one vacancy. Senior Citizen Property Taxation Workoff Program, Mylene Malari, Nancy Forrest, 
Sue Doherty, Sheila Cragen, and Robert Hamill. In town council is Mead, Tallerman, and Costa for our um, regular council and our labor council, Merrick O'Connell. And zoning board of appeals, Hans Wintra. Mm -hmm. So I just had a question. Um, some of these are annual appointments, but others are, some are three-year terms for boards that in the past we had been doing kind of a little, a little reappointment process. We're just lumping them together now, or? No, oh, yeah, actually, Carl yeah. filled out a reappointment form. So what, what it is, it's, it's, our, it's not technically annual appointments, it's the, we annually appoint. Okay. So we are appointing some for a one-year term, like the animal control officer is one-year term. These other ones are for the different terms that they are specifically there. So it's, it's, it's what is due to be renewed at this appointment meeting. Mm -hmm. An example might be the uh, Public Access Committee. Faith's term is up, so she's getting reappointed for three years. But yeah. there are other members of that committee that are still serving out portions of mm -hmm. when they got appointed. So, right. I mean, like when I was on the historic commission, they, <laughs> I left after my three-year term, but I was given paperwork and I was supposed to come here and right. say why I wanted to keep doing it. And the people right. were supposed to ask me now, if I was doing a good job. on the reappointments has been done. Yeah. Is that correct? It, it, it's, it's in. So if we it's want all to attach in here. further down below. Right. It's in, your, it's in your packet here. So, so the theory was we, we started the re-interviewing process um, as a first basis, mm -hmm. but then once we established the system, as long as there was a form, then we, we said we didn't need to uh, interview the reappointment as long as there was an application form there, and then we would just interview new appointments. Okay. I agree with Damon that I thought I remember hearing that the hope was, and this is just what I remember hearing, was to have people come back and right. sort of re-interview and open up the process for engaging new people. I know there was like specific circumstances in which that occurred. But. And also, I mean, not that we have people banging on the door to get involved, but if there are people who filled out talent bank forms for positions that are filled, if there was, should there be a, you know, a weighing of the new person versus the old person? Just No, I, I agree. I, my, my assumption is that there are no, that I, um, Elaine has sent us all the applications and there aren't any uh, applications for any of these positions. Other as than far me. as I know. But I think it probably. You know, and we, but we, we are asking people to <coughs> tell us what they contributed and what their recommendations are. So what do we do with that information? Why are we asking them? If we don't and I think we said we wanted to go over that. So, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, I agree. It's, it's a, an exercise in it. So do we want it, to, it's in here, right? Yes. So what, do we want to defer our, our, our vote until we've had an opportunity to read through it? And if there are any that we want to ask to come in, we can, we can do that? Or do we want to ask everybody to come in? I mean, I read through it. I don't think there was anything shocking, but it's just whether or not no, you know, but my, my point is we're asking these people to fill this out and to give us their recommendations, and if we, we just take it and file it, then it doesn't seem fair to even ask. Well, well and, and for instance, so we'll go to Carl's request, you know, some of the recommendations to improve operation of your committee. This came to us. We probably ought to forward this on to the Conservation Commission, saying please look at this and report back to us. I mean, if, if people are going to take the effort to make recommendations, we ought to, if we don't take action, we ought to send it to the committee they're being appointed to review it and report back to us. Yeah, or not ask. The clock winders, I'm not too worried about. Yeah, I mean, a lot, some of these are, you know, kind of boilerplate kind of things, but other ones are boards that, decision-making boards in town where someone might have something to say about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, what's our goal? I, 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 and I think what I'm going to suggest is we, we make the appointment and we add this to our goal discussion workshop of what do we, we, we probably ought to revisit the reappointment process for the communication side of that process. 
but at a minimum, I would suggest that if there's a substantive comment on the, uh, the submission, that it be sent back to the committee and ask them for feedback. Um, I like both of those recommendations. Yeah, I think we should do a point. And then I think, it, you know, just spend some time thinking about it. Yep, and I, I think it's good to, uh, to re-pass um, out our policy on, on appointments to just it's like there's especially a since we have new member too so process without a purpose yep yeah right we don't do the purpose let's get rid of the process okay so the first part of that was you you believe we should approve them yes. and then do that work yes. so can i get a motion to approve them i make a motion that we approve the appointments i would second that any Discussion other than what we just had? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Town manager appointments. Manager appointments. <clears throat> building Commissioner Gary Rhodes, Assistant Building Inspector Andrew Hudson, Dam Keeper Ronald Wilson. Now, what is what? What does the Dam Keeper do? Keeps the dam. Is, 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 is there any? Is there any report due or anything like that? Because we never hear a word from that. Um, if you read his talent bank form, it actually tells you what he does. And yeah. actually, there is a dam report listed on, on our, is it on our drive? I yes. think yeah, yeah. one time uh, yeah. Paul asked for the most recent, so it was somewhere on there our was, drive. There's actually a dam report. That's right. That's I remember right. reading it once. But that's done by a consultant. Right, but so therefore, it's theoretically they should be implementing the requirements of the dam report. Right. Assistant dam keeper Rich Patry, emergency management director Forrest Warden, fire chief Patrick Sullivan, fence viewers. There's vacancies. Field driver Kathy Como, hazardous waste coordinator Heather Lemieux, hearings officer Heather Lemieux, inspector of plumbing and gas Gary Williams assistant inspector of plumbing and gas Richard Capinas pound keeper Jean Larkin public weighers Rich Reynolds Juliana uh, de Prima Eric Morin Brian Contois Jay Valeri Mike Reynolds Brittany Woodhouse inspector of weights and measures Stephen Cullinane, Cull Cullinane. inspector of wires uh, Jack Beery Assistant Wiring Inspector David Stone, Races Control Officer Ralph Schwick, Brian LeBlanc, and Jean Schwick. Vacancies on the Town Forest Committee, and I don't know what that committee does. Tree Warden Jack Radequince, Veteran Service Officer TJ Blouser. Police officers are going to be appointed at the June 19th meeting. I feel it necessary to say that the wire inspector is my father, so I don't know if I'm supposed to abstain from any part of Maybe it. Just Probably from don't that need to. Appointment, just mm -hmm. with yeah. the exception. Is there a motion? I make a motion that we approve the town manager appointments. Second. S is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? One abstention in there someplace. Right. <laughs> I would like to make that official. Okay. Great. Uh, we have minutes for May 1st. Warrants. Accounts payable warrant the amount of three hundred and fifty five thousand five hundred and seventy four dollars and ninety cents. Uh, uh, payroll deduction warrant the amount of seven hundred and seventy three thousand five hundred and forty six dollars and sixty one cents. And a payroll warrant in the amount of $799,436.04. Uh, any action file issues? I have one. 
Um, when I uh, watched the May 8th meeting on YouTube, I was surprised with the process that was used for the review of the town manager's goals. I had understood that BOS members were tasked with reviewing the town manager's progress toward the goals she had set for herself when she was hired. And I prepared my review prior to the May 8th meeting and submitted them to the chair. But when I was watching the meeting, I realized there was a great deal of information added by the town manager at that meeting to further inform of her progress. Information I could not have had knowledge of when I prepared my review. So I was really confused by that because I didn't have the information I needed in order to do the review. There, there, there was things that she had done that I had put no progress because I hadn't seen any, yet a lot of progress in her self-evaluation, she provided a lot of progress at that meeting. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like we need to have a better timeline. Like I'd like to know now, I know that we're going to talk about her progress in November than in April. So I would like to know, when is her self-evaluation in November going to be ready? And can we talk about it a couple of weeks later? When will the uh, self-evaluation in April what date will she be do submitting that, and when will we be reviewing it? Because I was just very confused, and I didn't think the process certainly didn't work for me. I, I, I appreciate your input, and uh, my, my only response is that, unlike the performance portion of the review, the goal review was done at that meeting. In other words, it wasn't, none of us presented anything prior other than you, because you knew you weren't gonna be at the meeting. So, and, and we're setting our goals next week so we can set up, we can discuss the process for how we review it going forward. But the, you know, you provided some input to me which was helpful for us and I, and I read as much of it as I could into the record. But the rest of us discussed progress against our goals and her goals at that meeting and did not provide anything prior to it. Oh, so no one, no one else even thought about it ahead of time? Well, I'm sure they thought about it, but, I'm, but nothing was required to be submitted. You know, and that doesn't seem right to me either, that you, you know, you just at that meeting, you the first time to see it, and then you have to respond to it. Mm -hmm. right. So I guess I'd like to talk about that. Yeah. Just for another action. Um, <coughs> For the committee report assignment assignments, are we going <laughs> to rediscuss those? Or I think we kind of want to talk about the role, our roles within the other committees. Oh, the liaison. Then? Yeah. I, I had hoped that we would talk about that, and maybe the best time to do it is next week as part of our goal setting process. Okay. Uh, but is is there any, you know, in our current assignments, are there any? highlights that we want, need to talk about now or otherwise next week we should talk about how we handle the relationships between selectmen and sitting uh, committees and, and, and who does it. And which ones there should be and right. which ones we can exactly. let go of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. So. Just a brief question. Sure. There was an appointment for somebody for the Cultural Council on the agenda, we jumped around a little bit. Was that something we're doing tonight, for Liz uh, Nichols? No, they wish that to be hold off. Okay, I was just just making sure. Sorry. Okay, um, just our upcoming schedule again next week, June twelfth. For the most part, is our goal setting workshop. We may do a little little bit of business, but we're going to spend most of next week's meeting uh, setting or discussing and setting our goals for the upcoming fiscal year and beyond perhaps. Uh, June 19th is a regular business meeting and I'm gonna suggest that we think about not having a meeting on July 3rd, given the input I've gotten from many of us that we've got all things going on. Uh, having said all that, is there any public comment from the public? Please, Chief. Uh, cruise on up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is just a reminder to the public and to the board. We're conducting our cruise night tomorrow night on Memorial Drive. It begins at 8 p.m. Uh, 4 p.m. Sorry. <laughs> it ends at 8 p.m. There's a rain date, more importantly, just in case it rains, although it doesn't seem like it's going to. 
The rain date is June 13th, the following Wednesday, same time, 4 to 8, Memorial Drive. So hope to see you all there. Thanks. What was the rain date? June 13th, which is the following Wednesday. Okay. Okay. So they we won't need that, will we? Hopefully. Hopefully. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Any other public comment from the public, please? <clears throat> Dave Passios, 56 Whiting Street. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the fire chief and police chief uh, for their presentations and the representatives' presentations this evening. Uh, gave us a good picture of uh, what we're up against to uh, bring public safety up to somewhat par with what we need in town. I just want to remind everybody, and I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't realize that that's only two pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we have a DPW department that for the past eight years has not been fully staffed, uh, including their middle management or supervisory level positions, uh, which has put an awful lot of pressure on one person to run all those departments that we rolled into one. Uh, townside offices also, ours were cut. Uh, benefits were not really cut because they were all working, or for the most part, working 20 hours a week anyway, so they're still fully benefited positions. But we haven't brought the hours back to bring um, the office of town offices open to five days a week. And uh, so there are many more challenges than just the two public safety uh, departments. I fully support growing those departments, as I said during the campaign. Uh, but again, only two pieces of the very big puzzle. Thank you. Any other public comment from the public? Any public comment from the board? Okay. Move we adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody.